Knockback, the retro and nostalgia podcast, is brought to you by, well, you. If you want to learn how to support our show, go to patreon.com slash laststandmedia. Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to Knockback. My name is Colin Moriarty. I'm joined as always by my brother. Let me see here. I had it. It's like a. It's like Halloween for grownups. Moriarty. There it is. Dagan. It's like Halloween for grownups. Moriarty. Dagan. Thank you for joining me today. How are you today, my friend? You just described my entire life. Yeah, basically. Here's what I was thinking about. Please. This is what I spend my time dwelling on, Kyle. What happened to goofy golf? Why did it become mini or miniature golf? Goofy mm. golf is so much more appealing and fun. Yeah, I think it's because my theory on this would be because goofy golf is like the crazy shit's happening. The dude's coming up and he's coming back down. I think okay. mini golf is like more serious. Like there's a more well, I, I, where we go to Top Golf, I think it's called, where we okay. where I go drive yeah, with, yeah, down golf, with yeah. Uncle Mike and stuff. They have a mini golf course, but it looks like a dead ass serious mini golf course. <laughs> I love the idea of it. You're right, though. Some of them are just more refined and more classy. You mm-hmm. got the lighthouse, and maybe it's a little more beach themed or something. And then some of them are just like cartoon characters, and you're shooting the ball in the eye and stuff like that. Yeah, right? it's like, what's so goofy right now? I'm trying to go par three here. What's so goofy right now? Yeah. Um, I don't know about that. Why? Did you play recently? Were you a player I recently? I love that theory. No, he, the Richard Dreyfus character in the movie we're about to talk about, he says, what does he say? He says, it's more fun than Goofy Golf. Oh, right, 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 right. And right. I'm like, Goofy Golf. Right, 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 right. There's a name I haven't heard. There's a name. Time. <laughs> well, Dave, thanks for your patience. We're actually recording this on a Saturday. On Wednesday, we usually record, but Dagan was running late that day and I was trying to record early because I had to go to a doctor's appointment. So we're recording today, but then I'm running in 15 minutes later. So to this, because I was outside mowing the lawn, oh. it was really important for me to take advantage of this day. I actually woke up at like 1030, which is mega early for me and uh, went outside immediately mowed the lawn because it's cloudy and it's only like 80 four degrees or something right. outside. So I'm like, yeah, I got to take advantage of this day. So I went out there and I was just running a little bit late, but I was laughing to myself because man, am I making dad noises on a constant basis? Like we always make fun of our dad. Cause he's always like, <laughs> grunts and sighs. Right? Yeah, and, 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 and we used to make fun of him cause he would do that when he was drying off after a shower and you can like hear him across the house basically doing <laughs> and it. And I do the exact Me same too. shit. So I, I just realized that I, I was outside doing it. I was doing it in the shower left and right. I don't know oh, what, what that's all about. He passed yeah. that down like unbelievable. Dude, do you understand? I just got done. I was going to get bagels for Lil. Coming back, listening to NPR on the car. Hmm. I didn't. I knew how hot it was in Texas and points west, but I didn't realize it was like 150. It's been 115 degrees in Phoenix for three weeks straight. It is fr- the the western part of the country is literally boiling right yeah. now. Yeah, it's bad news. It's bad insanity. News. I don't know why anyone really even lives down there anyway. I don't know like why do you want to live in Phoenix? I mean, it's a it's a cool city, but it's just It's a big city too. Yeah, it is. It's just if the power goes out in Phoenix, man. I don't know. Good luck to you. And that's they what, must be built for it though. They have to be. It's funny you say this cuz Mike and I were just watching a um what was it? Uh vice like a vice episode about yeah. phoenix and it's specifically about how hot it is there but this was before all this happened and they were saying that like that they there's so much blacktop that it just absorbs all of the, the heat and that they're trying like crazy there to get trees planted but the problem is is that like when they plant trees in front of people's houses they need to water them themselves there's no like m- municipal watering thing so because oh. they're trying to make a ton of shade so it's Makes a really, inter- yeah, it's an interesting, interesting situation down there. But I just, I don't know, man. There's just certain places I don't think we're supposed to be living. I mean, when we were, when we were doing um, Blood Meridian, which is in that area, um, it's like, damn, dude, this is like an inhospitable place, even in the 21st century. And I was saying on, um, on, what was it? Oh, it was just yesterday when we were doing Constellation, the next episode of Constellation, I was saying that I went to Palm Springs a few times in California, which is a notoriously hot place like people go there when they're like i like my ex-girlfriend was like obsessed with 110 degree heat like she just loved it oh and, she enjoyed that oh she loved it dude we would go oh, to vegas in the summer insane. and lay outside at the at the resorts and all that kind of stuff and i was kind of like dying and palm springs was the only place i've ever been where i'm like i think i have heat stroke and i gotta like go sleep or something and i just <laughs> a bit much i could tell you kyle phoenix might be the fifth biggest city in the country and philly's right underneath that at sixth I could tell you if it hit 115 degrees for one day out here, the infrastructure would 
die. So they would like the electrical grid would just melt down. Like we're not built for that. Mm-hmm. So I do get concerned when I hear that of like, God forbid these people lose their power. They're going to, it's going to be serious business. Yeah. I think that there's got to be some sort of like really robust power situation there down there. You would have to yeah, assume. Absolutely. And this is why we just need, we need two things. We need nuclear power plants all over the United States and we need desalination plants all over the United States to get our power mm-hmm. and our water off, off the ocean. And, uh, yeah, the, the global warming situation is interesting or the climate change situation is interesting because part of it is like, there's no doubt. I was saying to Micah that I'm, a, and I think you might feel the same way. I'm old enough now where I actually do notice that it is getting hotter. Like it's definitely, oh, yeah. definitely getting hotter. But I think sometimes it's, we don't see the upsides and the downsides. For instance, uh, I was noting on Constellation that the earth is greening at a rate that we haven't seen in time immemorial, basically like just plants and trees and all these things growing at a rapid rate. I'm like, I bet you there are things that will happen that will be good because of this too. The earth has been so much hot. The earth has been so hot that there were no ice caps anywhere on the planet. And the earth has been so cold that the entire planet was covered in, in ice. So right. I, I, don't, I don't take it. I think it's a serious problem, but I don't take it mega seriously because I also believe two things. Number one is I think we're decades away from carbon scrubbing technology that's going to take care of this. The second, the second thing is, is that I just think that there's going to be all sorts of other adaptable technologies that just make the status quo, the status quo, because the reality about all this is, is that it's not going to stop because we have no power over the developing world. Yeah. How do you stop it? Yeah. Well, our, our carbon emissions are going down. My, I'm basically almost net neutral. I don't own a car. I have fucking solar panels on my house. Yeah. You know? Um, so, but the next thing I got to get is a battery bank for that very reason you're talking about, which is that battery technology sucks right now, but it's getting better. And I want to be able to store my power which yeah, I'm not absolutely. able to do right now, just in case things like that happen. Sure. Because I was telling you, I was looking at getting a gas, like a natural gas generator attached to our house. Yeah. And I just felt like it was so rude because it's so loud. So no, like the power goes out. And like every, everyone's <laughs> like, everyone know it. No one has power except for me. Like oh, everything's not in my house. And I'm like, I just think that that's, that's just, I don't know. That's a dickhead thing. I don't want to do that's that. That's very, that's like really like polite. To just be it's like we all got to kind of suffer, but it, but the but when I get a battery bank, that will be quiet, and then people will notice that my lights don't go out because of that. But and mean. you will change your mind once you lose power for five days, mm-hmm. like we did here when we first moved in, which was absolute. I was praying that I could afford that at that time. I definitely couldn't. But there's two people on my cul-de-sac. I, I've talked to you about this that have it, and it is noisy. And you would think that the I mean, and they've had it for a while, over a decade, but you would think the technology would improve. Maybe it has. Yeah, it, it, they. It was. We were suspicious because we went with the Generac, the company Generac, and we were talking to them. They came over, yeah. and I'm like, "So, do you have like an example of how loud it is?" And they're like, "Well, no, it's like a lawnmower." And I'm like, "That's pretty loud." <laughs> you know, loud. like what kind of lawnmower are you talking about? Uh, so yeah, I just you know you don't want to be rude to people, and yeah, it's thoughtful. at least that's my at least that's my thoughtful, take. my friend. But uh, thank you for your patience. It's good to see you. Uh, you too. Um, good to be here with everyone out there and and uh, talking about what's today. Close Encounters of the Third Kind, the Steven Spielberg flick from produced by the Phil. Are they, Julie and Michael Phillips? Are they a couple? I don't know who. They I do. think they were. They were at that time. Yeah. The huge falling out with Spielberg camp after this. Sometime after this movie, like really ugly. Actually, I didn't know that because I know that the Phillips. I think they did Taxi Driver as yeah, well. I think you're right. Um, they were with Schrader and Scorsese for that film. I think. So November 1977. So you're a young man when this comes out, a young boy. I watched the, what did I watch? The director's cut, which is 137 minutes. There are apparently three versions, like the cinematic release. And then what, there's some special edition that yeah. Spielberg didn't like, I think. And then they did like <laughs> so a director's cut. The movie made an enormous amount of money. And it's a really interesting. And you thought that this would be timely considering everything that's going on right now. I actually totally agree. I must say, I'm not sure I ever saw this movie. This was one of the movies where I, I was like, I must have seen this on HBO or something at some point, but I just don't remember it. And there are obviously iconic scenes in the movie that everyone would know, like the ship co- like rising. And there's some beautiful special effects in the, in the movie, in my opinion. But um, nonetheless, I, I feel like uh, I don't know that I've seen this movie front to back and I thought it was quite timely. It, it seems very, very apropos compared to what's going on right now. So let me throw it over to you and talk to you about Close Encounters of the Third Kind. What made you want to choose this movie for us to watch? <laughs> it makes me laugh. What better way to talk about something timely than to harken back 45 years, right? I mean, we could have we could have picked. I want I know how interested you are in the current UFO extraterrestrial phenomenon going on and that everybody is aware of. So I thought about let's connect knockback to that 
let's talk about a sci-fi movie, specifically an alien extraterrestrial related film. And we could have done any number of movies that are more contemporary that, and we will, a lot of these we will. Yeah, what could have we done? Let's think about that for a second. Yeah, like, yeah, of course. We could have done Interstellar. We didn't do that yet, right? Uh, I don't know. I can't read. Graydon just got done watching it. I was tweeting about this and he was fascinated with the movie only a few days ago. That's one of my favorites. And I was thinking, did we do that movie? We did. Number 70, we did Interstellar. Yes, okay. All right, so Interstellar could have been one of them. Contact probably would be a big one, although- the, the movie Contact is awesome, Jodie Foster. So good. But the the book would it be even interesting. More the Carl Sagan book would be even interesting that was to go through because yeah. that was a very very much like um, Arrival. That was a very um, scientifically grounded way that it could happen, which I thought was awesome. Like she would listen to washing machines, and she it was like it was a totally she would like listen for like signals and washing machines and listen to so good it was like so that if you've never i think you should recontact but at very least watch contact because it's probably one of the most compelling what if movies um but what what did, before we get into what we else we could have done what did you think of interstellar because that's that's uncle collins one of uncle collins very favorite films i know so. i know and i figured you would i figured you might not see the tweet because you're really not on twitter that much anymore it was the i tweeted about yeah, that it was the first movie i've ever seen Graydon watch as an older kid now, 12 going on 13, that really grabbed him by the lapels and he was fascinated by from start to finish. P.S. It's a long movie. And he was just in a, he was just fascinated from start to finish. He really, really loved it. It was the first movie I saw him respond to that like that, where we're always trying things, whether it's something retro or something contemporary. And when he was a kid, there were animated films, certainly, but this was the first adult film, quote unquote, that I really saw him get taken in by. And I was really proud of him for that. And I was like, wow, I wonder what he sees. And I think there's a lot to that movie. There's the science fiction end of it. And then there's the human story. There's the father daughter angle. And there's a lot going on there. But that is, what I do you think, think, he, do you think he one under- of my favorites. Do you think he, he's, very, he's scientifically minded, right? That's the other thing. I think it's his creativity, his scientific mind. I think his intre- his sensitivity, you know, as far as like the human angle in that story, not only the romance, but the familial sort of aspects of that film. I think it was a wash of everything. I think it was just like the perfect movie for Graydon. And he's very, it's kind of weird to articulate, but he's very Nolan-esque, like his personality. He's very thoughtful. He's very introspective. He's very science. He's very interested in science. He's got a creative sort of aspect to him. So I think it was just a confluence of everything with that movie. The other one I was thinking that that you and I haven't done comically. We talked about it in one of our anthology episodes, but Fire in the Sky yeah. we haven't done. Yeah, Fire War in the, the Sky. the Worlds we haven't done. Mm. Uh, Independence Day we haven't done. Independence Day. That's a Independence Day is a big one because Independence Day might touch on what is happening in real life more than the other ones because those are the aliens that are apparently or at least like the Roswell alien type thing yeah. like that's them so yes. in the in the story obviously yeah there's so many i i like this choice though because in some way this choice touches on well, Independence Day touches on it too, but this this really does touch on the government see- keeping the secret from people. Absolutely, um, like because in Independence Day you discover like the Department of Defense always knew, like the 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 the, the, that the president was never told, but that the Secretary of Defense always knew about the alien craft and all that, which is so cool. And I think Independence Day, and I've said this before, it gets cooler the more time goes on. Like that movie gets better and more on the nose the more time goes on about just all sorts of different things, how you would communicate with them how they'd come and fuck you up and all that. And that's why I was so disappointed with the second, the sequel, because the sequel sucked. Yeah, that was not a good follow-up. That is a very special movie in terms of flavor. You get something very specific from that movie that not a lot of other films, specifically sci-fi films, give you. So we will talk about that. But I figure, you know what? Let's harken back. Classic vintage era Spielberg. There's a lot of Spielberg in this. I think it's fascinating to go back to this era of late 70s Spielberg, where he was really rising to power and had like really he was coming into his own with final cut and everything post jaws post the success of jaws i think he was really bankable at that time and also a little 70s love in general let's go back to a time of every other car being a station wagon mm-hmm. actual paper maps 
knee high tube I, socks. I love like, the paper. The paper maps were an awesome touch. Like when dude. he pulls the thing down from his, like it's a map in a classroom from the visor. Yeah, like I loved that. So that was good, so dude. cool, man. That must have been so tough. It was another time. You know, we don't have enough seventies love on knockback. I spent six years there. I just. It's very nostalgic for me. And, you know, this movie, you know, the other thing, selfishly, two other aspects that I wanted to, I, this has been on my list since the beginning of Knockback. One, I've only seen it once prior to watching it a couple of times, more times now. And two, I was forbidden to watch this as a kid. Did you know that? No, I didn't. So this Mom is one of those random movies. Horrified. Yeah, this is one horrified of those. of this movie. You can watch Poltergeist, the, but you can't watch. Complete wrong impression. Like I remember <laughs> when it came out in the theaters in November. Of 77, I'm sure I didn't even realize what it was. By the time it hit cable, Showtime, and you know, maybe made for TV cuts and all that kind of thing, and let's say the early 80s, at that point, mom was like, You're not watching Close Encounters. Like, I remember that being on her bullet point list of this is a movie you're forbidden to watch. And I, vis a vis, I was scared of it because of that. Yeah, right, exactly. Isn't that so interesting? Because like they were cool with Mommy Dearest, they were cool with. A series of Stephen King, yeah, Poltergeist. Like I said, Stephen King film, like Stephen King films. I, it's so weird what they gleamed onto and what they didn't. They had no yeah. problem with you bringing me to Fire in the Sky when I was fucking seven years old. That <laughs> like movie complete, still haunts me. Like that was a haunting moment in my life. You know, dude, and like, they didn't. Ca- they didn't care. A horrifying movie. Yeah, it is. I don't know what you're you know. And I, w- I came out of that school of like that whole misconception, like. Don't watch Close Encounters, which is a tame movie. Honestly. It is. It's not scary at all. But I re- I just rented you Watership Down, which is a cartoon with blood and gore in it, and you're you're six and you've never seen that in a cartoon, you know. So it's like, and you know, it makes sense though. This is the first time this dawned on me when I was writing notes for the episode. Think about let's channel 1977. Mom, she's in her twenties, right? Mm-hmm. She's alone. Much of the time, our dad was a firefighter and worked like two, three, four day tours, plus his side job. So dad was gone for long stretches, three or four days at a time sometimes. She's a young mom, home alone in a quiet suburb, right? And anything that she probably felt could possibly potentially scare us was off the table, not only for us, but for her, because I don't think she needed more fuel to worry, right? Like I think that was probably a lot of it with mom. Like it was enough to hear the neighbor saying like close encounters were scary or some kind of hearsay in the new, in a newspaper article or something. That was enough to just shut it down. You know, that it was this movie for that reason and Flashdance was the other one, which I understand. Yeah, Flashdance that's a little, a little yeah. more. A little more sexual, yeah, yeah. A little more. Yeah. But I was also a little older when Flashdance was pulled off. Like you're not, do not let me catch you watching Flashdance or Close Encounters. You know, that was the two things. But I think that was probably it. Mom, you know, mom was young. She was, what was she? 27 years old, mm-hmm. right? She was, she was a kid. Yeah, that's crazy when you think about mom, mom and dad being in their 20s and 30s. So like crazy. I was thinking about that. I think, uh, yeah, because like mom and dad are, I'm older than mom and dad were when they had me. It's just so interesting. They were already four kids deep. It's yeah. A Dude, it's time. insane to think. Yeah, they had me at 22. Yeah, it's a different time. It's like people, you know, Dustin's mom had him when he was when she was 16. Yes. And uh, so like these things happen. But I'm just so surprised I've gotten so far without, you know, messing anything up. I guess it was pretty interesting. Maybe, I, maybe I'm just <laughs> it's shooting a different parts. generation. Um, but you know what? Yeah. Now we're enjoying especially Dustin and his parents. Like he's enjoying that relationship as a 30 year old with parents that are truly young I yeah mean, they're, they're cool they're fun they we consider that yeah we 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 love them they're they're like uh like we were saying i'm kind of in between dustin and his parents ages like i'm mm-hmm. close I'm, I'm fairly close to his parents age which is that's right pretty funny yeah um so let me ask you this about this film before we get any further is this film good because that was one of the things that i was when i was watching i'm like i'm not so sure about this movie actually like it's i'll say a few things about it it's cool idea beautifully shot a lot of good special effects, although some of the special effects in hindsight, it's like, damn, this looks a little sterile, like uh, the road where they're watching the air, the uh, the ships come in. That's obviously a set when they're looking down at the like the secret encampment with the the landing strip. That's obviously, you know, um, composited in. So there's those things stand out, but it's actually in in the same year A New Hope comes out. It's not quite as anywhere near as sophisticated as what ILM was doing, but it's just 
it's pretty cool from an aesthetic point of view. I like it from that point of view, but I actually think the movie is a little confusing. I'm not entirely sure it moves very quickly. It, it, I guess in this age of TV, it's like, damn, this could have been a cool five hour story or something like, give me a little bit more. What? Yeah. He's a power. So, you know, he's the the main character works at a power company. He's called in because all this random shit. He's going to check it out. He gets lost. He almost gets abducted or whatever. And so he gets fired and becomes obsessive with this thing. But it's just kind of. I don't know like his wife leaves him. He has this kind of tryst with this other woman. He's obsessed with this with the, you know, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a cool and interesting film, but I'm not sure I was like crazy about it, to be honest with you. I'm curious what you thought about it from a quality standpoint. Yeah. It's an interesting part of the conversation and definitely makes me laugh. I remember not too long ago, by coincidence, I saw, I watched an interview with a young John Carpenter. Like this was probably early eighties and he, it was a very opinionated sort of diatribe that he went off on specifically naming other directors and calling them out and saying how bad they were. And Spielberg was one of them. All right. Well, take it easy on and, that maybe, but yeah. All right, so. <laughs> <laughs> like it was bad form, but I'm thinking like young, heady filmmaker flying off at the mouth, like a little too opinionated, probably regrets it. But specifically talking about Close Encounters and saying what a mess it is and how Jaws was the only good thing Spielberg ever did and how terrible Close Encounters was and, you know, it shouldn't even be counted as far as an iconic sci-fi film and all of that. And I went through and watched it the first time back for, for Knockback through that lens. And honestly, it is this beautiful mess. It's very bipolar and disjointed. I think you said it really well, Kyle. Beautifully shot movie. You want a sort of, um, you want to learn how to make a movie and translate a film from storyboard to final shot and put things across with clarity and cleverness. This is a masterclass in that. Like it's, it has all the Spielberg, Spielberg hallmarks of beautifully shot, beautifully lit, great ideas, but it's kind of operating on two levels. Some of the film is very naturalistic and realistic, right? Think of the scene, the interior of the um, flight control room with the guys talking over each other. And it feels very realistic and very grounded. Or the scenes inside of the power plant with the engineers kind of and the electricians talking to each other and stuff. And then there's another part of another half of the movie that's very sort of contrived, very cartoony and very stylish. It's like two films operating in one. And then on the same level, you have this sort of butting of heads between the sci-fi angle and something that either was half-assed or came out on the cutting room floor, which is all the human drama. You got this sort of restless man-child, sort of seemingly unhappy a marriage on the rocks kind of indicated, but not really this other romance, a guy leaving his family. There's some human drama in there, but we just get inklings of it. Like it, it was either forgotten about or just not really fully realized in the film. The film's trying to be a lot of different things. And I think by, you know, as a result of that, it feels a little sloppy. It does. It has flashes of brilliance in it, and I enjoyed it for that. I mean, the color in this film is so mm -hmm. vivid. It's mm -hmm. so beautifully shot. And a lot of it, especially the stuff with the extraterrestrials or inferring that there are extraterrestrials around, feels like a beautifully depicted, tr traditionally animated cartoon. Like, it feels like what like uh, something like courage the cowardly dog would do later with like lighting and exaggeration and making things feel otherworldly and haunting and then you also have all that brilliant you know like set pieces crowd seeds in india the world war ii planes being deposited in the desert you know the brilliant shot of the car headlights lifting up behind the richard dreyfus character like Flashes of absolute brilliance, but the movie really feels like it's trying to do everything. And I wonder if that's a result of, you know, being a young director at the, you know, just coming into his power. I wonder if that's a, you know, a sort of mandate of the movie studio saying, like, give us a Jaws in space. 
and forget about the human stuff. Like, let's just scare us. Obviously, it's going to end on a positive note when we find out the extraterrestrials are friendly. But can you scare us a little bit like you did with Jaws? But let's do it in the sky this time. I don't know, but it definitely feels harrowing in that it's just a, it's just kind of a mess. It's kind of a hot mess. It's a fun hot mess because I think it's so retro, but it is interesting. And I, I think that's why there's so many cuts of this film, because I think it was Spielberg trying to reel it in, trying to contain, you know, and, and try to make something out of these. It's an amazing collection of parts, but once it's collected, it's sort of falls flat of everything. I mean, look at the bookends, right? You got Jaws beforehand and you got things like Sugarland Express and Duel and everything. And then after this, you have things like Indiana Jones and E.T. and Poltergeist, like really great stuff on the bookends. And then this and 1941, which is his, his famous World War II comedy flop, are in between. So maybe it was just kind of like, it feels like kind of a sophomoric effort, right? He started off strong, went to a sophomore slump, and then of course rose to power by the time we hit the early to mid 80s. So maybe that's, that's kind of what this is. You know, it's kind of like a, um, he was a journeyman at this point. Yeah, it's interesting. I agree. Like, what is the film about? That's kind of the, wh- what did he want to say with this? Because there's a lot of cool tethers, but yeah. I think each tether could have been its own film. So what I mean by that is, and, and I wrote some of these down, just the idea of communicating with the ship is its own movie. This And and I would guarantee you that Arrival was gar- was influenced by this movie in that way when i was watching this because i had seen arrival in the theater when it came out i haven't seen it since but when i was watching i was like this is a right like this this specific section about the music notes and the colors that's arrival because arrival doesn't do music notes and colors but it's all about how the fuck do we talk to them yeah right and that could just be one focus of it you have this really cool tether that they really don't explore about how they seem to be in some sort of communication this really touches a lot with um with what's going on in the modern day where the where these whistleblowers are saying and this is what's so fucking creepy i think is about the real day stuff is there they were ba- they're basically insinuating like we might have some sort of understanding with them that way we we obviously aren't privy to like and this indicate this movie explores that too they're sending people to go be with them after all these people that were um abducted or returned right all the people in the red suits including the main character who ends up the protagonist ends up in, in that group as well. Who the hell knows how that happened? I mean, it's like all sorts of weird. So this guy just broke into a, the most top secret military installation ever outside of maybe the Manhattan Project. And uh, he's just now he's like, yeah, send him on the fucking interstellar spaceship. So that's a little weird, but they they have. So, yeah, so let's go through it again. They have the communication. They have the ability of like, so the, how they communicate. The understanding itself is its own movie. So like we're sending people to be with you. Well, you could imagine a movie where Maybe this movie exists. I don't know. But where there is some sort of understanding and the first group of people that are going to be sent to be with the aliens are being trained and kind of debriefed and all of that stuff. And you get to see everything through their eyes and they no one else in the world really knows about any of this. So that's like its own thing, too. That was really frustrating. The time travel. Uh, it's not really time travel, but uh, it actually is because they're depositing the people as they were when they were abducted, whether they're sure. children or pets or the pilots that are being deposited as they were in the forties and so on and so forth. So there's that whole like time dilation element to it as well, which is more like interstellar in some way. So, and then there's the whole people seeing things, people being abducted. So much more of like a fire in the sky element. They have all these different elements combined together. And though the movie movie is a meaty two hours, 20 minutes or so long, I actually don't think it's sufficient in its runtime to really explore all those things, which is why I think they really should have cut some of that stuff out. Like here's, Again, Colin, we're already redesigning famous movie, right? <laughs> what I would have done, like everything's good for the yeah, the electric company, the guy, he gets, they, they all get psychically imbranded with this vision of Devil's Tower and all that stuff. It's good shit. But what should, what it should be instead of you go there and you're like, okay, the government built a landing strip here. How the fuck did they hide this? How quickly did this happen? How long have they been hiding this part? What is any of this? This doesn't make any sense what it should have been is them going to a crashed alien or an alien that landed and been like, and that like it's their first encounter with them. And the people that are sneaking on to that 300 mile square mile or area of Wyoming are the ones that are like seeing this first encounter um, as it were, which would be so much cooler. So 
they almost they almost get there, but it, they just it doesn't quite execute. I don't know what the movie's really trying to say or what. <laughs> You know, but like, when you find out they're yeah. just – they kind of orchestrated and erected that entire thing just on the other side of the mountain. <laughs> it was like it's very – it's a very two-dimensional premise of like why is nobody sneaking on from the other side of the mountain? That doesn't really – again, it's very cartoony. Also, they're using anti-gravity ships it looks like. So why would they need a landing strip? Mm. It, it, this, there's just a few things that just don't really make a lot of sense. It's a cool visual, but – None of that really washes. And by the way, there's like 8 million people at this thing. So oh, I don't yeah. know how you're keeping this a secret. <laughs> then again, then involved. again, there are, I mean, the <laughs> argument here is that there are a lot more people than you would think that has worked, that have worked on alien technology and have really kept it secret or might not have even really known what they were working on. Um, yeah, sure. So, that, that's possible too. Yeah. So does that make sense to you? I feel like there's a bunch, there's like a fire in the sky element. There's a, a rival or contact element. There's an independence day element. There's sure. all these different elements, but they don't really... They try to have it all, but Independence Day is just Independence Day and fire in the sky is just fire in the sky and all that. So I really feel like it really should have been about these people being psychically implanted with this stuff and their journey to this, either this landing site or this crash site or whatever, where they're getting there at the same time as the government, I think would have been pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, you're you're absolutely right. It does, it feels like an amateur chef just putting too many things in the pot. It's like too many ingredients. It's too much excitement. It's too much creativity. You got to, you know, this is maybe before Spielberg learned restraint. And we, you know, that's still to this day, we don't know Spielberg. We know Spielberg for a lot of things. Restraint's not one of them. You know, extremely creative, yes, but maybe needs to have those people marshalling him. But it is, it's a collection of all those things. And it does have the same ingredients as an arrival or an interstellar where you have the compelling sci-fi elements with the extraterrestrials and the technology and the futuristic aspects and all of that thing and the intrigue. But you also have all those sort of heart wrenching family dynamics with it. With Arrival had it with the mom and the daughter and the husband, and it was sort of a retroactive thing. You know, you don't realize it's going, it's showing you the present and then taking you into the past to show you how things evolved. Interstellar does something very similar with a father daughter dynamic. This had sort of hints of that, but. Like, you know what I would have loved to see in this movie? I understand now we know 45 years on, like, we didn't really know if the extraterrestrials in this movie were going to be friendly by the end. And in all fairness, science fiction up to this point, almost to a movie or to a book, had the aliens as adversarial, right? Or as enemies or as a threat in some way. So this was one of the first works of sci-fi that made aliens that were seemingly friendly or benevolent, right? So it had that going for it. Now that's sort of, uh, we have the other things to think of, but this was kind of the beginnings of that. So that's number one. But number two is I would have loved to see, like here you have this character who's obviously this kind of man child. He's got his train set, right? He's got his Star, Star Trek Enterprise hanging from the ceiling. He's got his toy cars and his models and everything like that. And maybe it's a kind of a failing marriage. Maybe this guy's unhappy. They're trying to make it work, right? And he's got this encounter. He's got the sunburn on his face, right? He sees this UFO. Now he's got this almost psychic, unexplainable sort of hypnosis. He's enchanted. He's possessed. He doesn't really know why. And I know there were scenes of him like fully clothed in the shower, like just kind of wrestling. They with should himself. have done like, that. See, that's good stuff. Keep like, it in there. Yeah, that's the stuff that that's I think is the good. Good shit. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. why is this happening to me? Why do I feel this way? Why can't I be a good dad? Like, they took all that out, almost to the detriment of the film because you could you could have had it both ways. Mm-hmm. You could have gave us a little more substance, but instead we get just kind of glimpses of you know the wife's unhappy. She's leaving now. He's forming this romance with some other woman who's compelled. But of course, she's compelled because our little kid got abducted. So she's got a stake in it. He really doesn't. He can't explain it. It's like, it's too much. It's just, and now now they're kissing. Now he's leaving his family. He's going off in the yeah, ship. Now he's, he's like, like going away. Like now the government's cool with him. Like where did he, because I do think there's a cool shot of him when he's going to the into the installation where they're all like enamored with the ship. So no one's paying attention to him and he's just walking amongst them. I think that's actually a really cool shot like that. No one realizes or cares that he's there. Yeah. But they, yeah, yeah, but, yeah. It, but it, see the cool, I love that unbelievable sci-fi, but the coolest sci-fi in my opinion, Interstellar, The Martian, The Expanse, whatever, mm, it's good. all it's all based on what could be, 
right? Yeah. In fact, a book that um, that Graydon might like now that it might be a little sophisticated for him at his age. I don't think so, though. Written by Kip Thorne, which is called The Science of Interstellar, because Kip Thorne was the science advisor on Interstellar, and everything that happens in Interstellar is conceivably possible under how we understand physics, and he explains so cool. all of it, you know, from the Tesseract to the time dilation to all the different things. And I think that it's a it, that's like there's one area of like hard sci fi like that, but a more humanist sci fi where we don't really know anything about the aliens. Perhaps we never even see them, which I would have been totally fine with. Like seeing them at the end is kind of stupid. It's cool yeah. to think it's cool to know that they're all like little girls yes. under the outfits, which I think is really hysterical. Um, but I'm like, eh, you don't really need. And they're and the, you know, they're gray, they're the gray aliens, you know, it's like, all right, eh. It would have been cool. And I know that Spielberg, they did like a, a pickup of a shot in the ship that then went in the director's cut and he like hated this and wanted to remove it. And so I think his he, he's more into the mystification as well. But I just think it should have just been about the ships never seeing the aliens and like just this. I know it's called Close Encounters of the Third Kind. That's its own. That, that title means something, but it's about the first encounter. It should have been, in my opinion, about the first encounter of just a governmental or scientific force and just some people that are being psychically implanted. At r- arriving at the place at the same time, basically. Um, I just think it would have been m- much more compelling. Then you really focus on the human element of... So if if Fire in the Sky is about the abduction, right? Yeah. And this would be about like the discovery, the human... As an example, there's a video going around, I'll send it to you, of what purports to be like a better clip of one of these ships these alien ships that the pilots are encountering and i watched it and my fucking skin went cold you were saying yes not because it looks like anything crazy like it's still pretty blurry and it could be fake or whatever but just because i'm like i might be looking at something that is truly inhuman like um and it's wild so just that is in itself a fascinating story and that's what this should have been you know just i love that Yeah, because every sci-fi, you're right, Kyle, because every sci-fi movie has a bent, right? Like an Arrival does it, and I think Interstellar does the same thing a little differently. Like Arrival is basically saying like these aliens are contacting you, you're figuring out their language through symbols, so through written, sort sort of a written language. And what it comes to be is they're warning us to, you know, they're warning us because in however many years they're going to need our help. So they need us to thrive and exist, right? Which was a cool premise. Interstellar does the same thing, but it happens to be the future version, if I'm not mistaken, the future version of humans warning humans or or an alien race teaching the humans to look into the future to explore beyond three dimensions, right? The fourth and fourth and whatever, however many dimensions to educate us on how we could continue to live in other places, right? This one could have just been simply the first contact with an alien race who maybe we could get on with, not get it on with. Mm. But maybe, I mean, if you have Mass Effect, you know. <laughs> but I like that. Just It's the begin and, and then leave it that way. That's beautiful. No sequels, which it never did have a sequel, which is good. But yeah, like just leave it like this is our this is our first contact with aliens who we could actually form a constructive relationship with. It's not going to be adversarial. It's going to something could come of this. Who knows? The end. Right. Exactly. Cool. I think that you just yeah, just stick and move and get out of there. You know, yeah, I, I just absolutely. For the saga, for the for the sci fi sagas that try to say too much, you need more time. And that's why I think Battlestar is so powerful. That's why I think the Expanse is so powerful. Do, do you know? Anything? I actually haven't finished it, but do you do you watch the Expanse or anything? No, oh, never oh my checked God, it that, out. That shit is fucking, dude. The science, the sci-fi in that, and the science in that is so cool. Like, um, I have to watch that. There's a, you know, do you know what Ceres is? C e r e s. It's like the, it's like a planetoid in the asteroid belt. Oh, sure, yeah, yeah. In between yeah. Mars and, and Mars and the Earth. I love that. Or, I'm sorry, between Mars and Jupiter, and um, people live there, and in the book and this is how cool the science is like so people humans grow up there born there grow up there but they because the gravity is so much less there their bones and bodies become very brittle so that they really can't leave and when they commit crimes they're brought to earth and tortured simply by being on earth because the the being on earth is like basically crushing them and so so like when they want to torture people from there, they just bring them to earth and like Holy extract shit. things out of them because they just can't be there. Like they, they just can't, can't take simply, it. Yeah. And uh, that's like the good shit, you know, and 
but you got to flesh that out and let and let that breathe. If you want to just say a simple thing in a motion picture, I think you got to choose pick and choose. And so the potential here, I think, was totally lost. I think it makes a little like I hear this movie bandied about, but I don't ever hear anyone recommending this movie or very many people. So I, I think it is. Point. I think it is kind of lost in like the B tier of big budget sci-fi, you know, I mean, and, and it cost like 20. And first of all, I, I think it cost Spielberg was basically running up credit cards and like not lying about how much it cost, which is hysterical for like the he entire time it or something. Yeah, like it was literally I think he said it was going to cost six million dollars and then it cost like 20. And um, I love that shit yeah. because it really speaks to me, like yeah. the conviction or just the fingers crossed mentality. But you're right. This is one of those. I do feel two ways about it. I feel like it is one of those movies of how can you have a conversation about movies, specifically science fiction? having not seen this movie. It's a must see, but kind of only because it's a legendary filmmaker and a legendary time for filmmaking and sort of a formative time for science fiction. That's really why it's not necessarily the work itself, although there are aspects of the work that I would highly recommend. Like again, an absolute masterclass in cinematography. I mean, the fact that Spielberg was so young and putting just just in the beat to beat frame by frame shot to shot editing and the framing and the color and the lighting forget about the effects forget about anything innovative with the effects at that time ILM Dennis Murin all of that stuff we'll get into John Williams but just the visual components of this film without you know without the flourishes it's a masterclass it really is in terms of like you could understand – and this is kind of a, a weird movie. You could understand this movie just by watching it with the sound off and probably without the effects passes. You know, you'll just get it because it's just – so I would recommend it for that. But you're right. Like I wouldn't recommend it to somebody if you just want to see an enjoyable film. You know, even though I, I, I bought it on Amazon because it's so cheap, it was like – an extra buck just to buy it. Oh yeah. I didn't even notice. So that. I was getting ready to tell Helene and, and G are down the shore and I was getting ready to say like, watch, you should watch Close Encounters tonight. It's kind of like, and I didn't because I was just like, he just watched Interstellar. I'm going to totally, I'm going to take him out. Like I'm, he's going to like. Yeah. It's going to be hard to go back to. <laughs> no, you can't, you can't go, you can't go from Interstellar to Close Encounters. Maybe I this can't. will make him a Nolan guy. Maybe he'll, maybe he'll, he'll come back and ask you to go see Oppenheimer. <laughs> um. <laughs> So I do want to double what you said, though. I do think the visual flair of the movie is beautiful. In fact, I noticed certain motifs in the movie that I thought were really cool. Did you notice that? Like basically every time they show the starry sky, something's moving in it. So cool. I love that. Like I thought that that was a really. I, I'm not great at noticing shit like that. I'm really not a very deep film watcher. No, you are. Dude, you recognize something that they did in this movie, I think, for the first time. Like they're even it, a lot of it shot on location. Even the stuff that's on set with matte paintings and stuff, those stars are traditionally animated. Did you know that? No, I didn't. No. You reckon, but you knew, you re- You saw that. They were traditionally animated by animators and composited as a pass to make them look more realistic and kinetic and having those little, you know, like a, a little twinkle instead of being so flat. And you saw that. I don't think I would have noticed if I didn't see the making of. Yeah, I, I didn't watch. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah, I, I, I just the stars really popped. I didn't know if they were filming. I didn't know that they were fake. I, I, I thought that they probably composited the movement of the shooting star over it, but or whatever they were showing. But I had assumed that they were just filming way outside of L.A., maybe in the middle of nowhere, getting really bright. You know, which on, they did sometimes. You know, yeah, Alabama, and get, getting yeah, yeah beautiful skies and all. And obviously, yeah, they filmed on a location in Wyoming and stuff like that. Which, but. Yeah, you definitely notice that the skies, the skies pop and there is a really there's something so interesting about the presentation of 70s era transitional um, um, technologies. Microprocessor exists by this point, but there's still no real like Apple one is starting to creep out and people are starting to get like these workspaces yeah. and, and we're starting to get around it. But I was laughing when I was looking at this like high tech human installation as they're welcoming the aliens or whatever. And I'm like, look at this fucking thing. They have like real for real real to reels and all this crazy tape decks and no monitors anywhere basically the only really high tech for the time stuff that they show is the radar screen where, where the guys like the black guys like i think smoking a cigarette or whatever and they're looking at that i'm like that's like mega technological when they're looking at the oh, map yeah. and they're trying to figure out the gps coordinates and they realize that the numbers are all these gps coordinates and um that's super cool. And that for 1977 or 1976 when they filmed it or whatever, that was really high tech. But it's just so funny. The 70s 
are so quaint from that point of view because things really start to move quickly beginning with Apple one and especially Apple two and then the IBM clone and all of the rest and you're off to the races so that by the time you get to something like think we haven't done this yet we got to do this because this is another timely movie is war games Um, oh god yes which is an absolute classic the only winning move is not to play (laughs) so good Um, and so by the time you get there so that's 82 83 so that's six years later he's got like a computer in his room you know and that's not considered really crazy at that point so it's just cool so i love that transitional time um yeah you're leaving the analog age mm -hmm. but it's still very much analog Mm -hmm. and in the filmmaking you know a lot of this was you know you had the computer technology you had they they were already doing the motion control cameras i mean don't forget for some context star wars was only months earlier in may by the time this came out started to come out in november so we're entering that age of digital trickiness, but mm-hmm. you still have the practical, the analog, the optical effects, miniatures, puppetry. Did Spielberg and Lucas know each other at this point? Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah. So oh, yeah. I wonder like I guess really they were worried about a new hope at this point, but it's like a little you wonder like how this would have benefited if it came out in nineteen seventy nine and ILM was really up and running and could have done this along with Empire. But I, sure. I, but at the same time, I just don't think it really needs much work. I think it, but if anything, they just show too much. They don't need to yeah, show as much I as they do. I think you're right. You know? That's absolutely right. I mean, think about what George Lucas did just, you know, earlier in the year with the cantina scene, let's say. It's smart because a lot of it's practical, a lot of it's puppetry, but it's quick editing. It's shot in mid shot, right? You're not showing too much. It's fast. It's just enough. And some of it looks wonky by today's standards. Don't get me wrong, but that's the way to do it. You don't linger too long in a shot. You show just enough. You light it dubiously. You put some fog and smoke in there to cover up the, you know, the strings and the, you know, the stuff you don't want the audience to see. And you do it in such a way that you take, you're taking advantage of what's available to you, right? You're not, showing too much or trying to be too show offy. I mean, I'm, I am surprised Close Encounters doesn't channel more of Jaws in that, where it's like, it's all suspense. You barely see the friggin' shark. It's all the buildup, you know? Um, and I think Spielberg does eventually learn that, but then I kind of check myself too when you think of things that come much later, like Jurassic Park, which obviously the technology was much different and it's be- it's still beautiful and holds up, but you know, there's no restraint in Jurassic Park. You see the dinosaurs every two seconds. Mm-hmm. And you there are a lot of so it's practical, it's, you know, which is cool yeah, and expensive. Yeah. Oh, yeah, dude. Yeah, I think he must have learned something from this film. Just the fact that he wasn't happy with the edit, wanted to go back and edit it, re-edit it again. I think that they, I think there is a fourth edit, as if I recall, that they showed in the theaters in the theaters in the 90s that I don't think is available as well. Yeah, he so, pulled it, yeah. So I don't think... He's ha- like, I just think that, that indicates to me that that's a filmmaker not necessarily happy with the yeah, the final but you can't do. You can't go back. Like he learned a lot, right? He's only grown as a filmmaker. You can't go back to your freshman efforts and say like, "Let's rethink that." You leave it. You leave it. But you, you know, just leave it alone. I understand you showed too much. You don't want to see the interior of the control room on the mothership and all those things. That honestly, you probably should have thought of for somebody as brilliant as Spielberg. Like, you know, you're giving away everything. You're you're showing and you know like show don't tell right like everybody everybody knows that but yeah it's it's going back and trying to retcon it's too much leave it you know do it for the next project learn your lessons and, and apply them to the next thing that's what I love you what know, that growth what did we think about Richard Dreyfus in this in this film mm. I I like Richard Dreyfus uh, as a as a performer I don't know that he brings anything crazy special to this character. Knowing that he was basically not even a choice at all for them, like that there was a there's a list of 10 actors that they wanted to get for this role before they even got him um, and that it was really just his connection with Jaws, you know, as as Hooper on that, that um, that I think, you know, finally Spielberg's like, fine, like, I'll, I'll let you do it. But I think he's fine in this. I, I don't know if they ever work together again, though. I was, I was trying to look through. Mm. Spielberg's films not that Spielberg like has like a, a, a cast that he always goes back to he's not he's not a Christopher Nolan type in that regard but um, I don't know I don't I, he was fine in this I like some of his later performances in his career I was telling Micah that I'm actually really fond of the 1995 film Mr. Holland's Opus I don't know if you mm. if you know that film or not um no of course where he yeah. plays Glenn Holland the music teacher I thought that was, and and uh, 
I think he was nominated actually for the Academy. I think that was an Academy Award nominated role, if I remember correctly, where he plays like a younger version of himself, I think, and then an older version of himself. And um, so he's he's he has a lot of great, a great uh, Krippendorf's uh, Tribe is another awesome movie. Do you remember that movie from 1998 no. where he's um he plays like a professor who it's actually a really great movie. He plays a professor, an archaeologist. And I think something happens like his wife leaves him or something. So he's stuck with his kids. And so he basically f- pretends that he's overseas at this crazy thing, like and and doing this crazy research on this unknown tribe. But he's actually doing it with his kids in their backyard. And <laughs> and it's really, really as I, I remember it being like, it was very, very funny and very cute. Yeah. Krippendorf's tribe. It's called if people want to check it out. I'm going to write this down. But um, yeah. What do you so what, let's talk a little bit about Richard Dreyfuss. What do we what do we think about him in this? He's interesting to me as an actor because he embodies something different in every for me in every era that we know him in like 80s and 90s talking about Mr. Holland's Opus is a great example. What about Bob opposite Bill Murray? Right. He goes on in his later years to play like an iconic stuffed shirt, you know, and he's so good at that role. But being a young actor in this, I think of Jaws, he's very appealing in American Graffiti actually too. But specifically in the Spielberg projects in Jaws and this, I think he plays a really good sort of disenfranchised younger adult character. Like somebody who's... um. I don't know. Somebody's in the in in the arc of his growth. It's sort there's sort of a learning curve growing on going on. Something with, and I think it ch- bless you. I think it challenges his personality too, or channels his personality because I think, from what I know of Richard Dreyfuss, especially as a young actor in Hollywood, he was pretty despised. He would he and he says this now. I think he owns this, but he would go to directors like Spielberg and basically badmouth everybody so he could get the part. And again, I think he owns up to this. I think he claims this in interviews and kind of laughs at himself in retrospect, but I think it was people like Spielberg that kept him going, or he probably would have blackballed himself right out of Hollywood with the way he behaved. I think he was also a famous sort of curmudgeon, very aloof with interviewers and the press and the media and stuff. But he's interesting because he's a different flavor for every decade, I feel like. He's kind of reinvented himself very cleverly, which I think is cool. And I I think he's good. I think he's, I don't think he's one of the greats, right? I don't think he's a Dustin Hoffman. He's not a De Niro. He's not even a Christopher Walken, but and he's not a Pacino or something like that. But he's, he's a very unique character in Hollywood in the, in fact that his style changes. I've never seen that before. Like Chris Walken is a great actor. But he's always got that Chris Walken-ish thing going on, right? Dreyfus always is there's there's a constant evolution, which is super, you know, super interesting. And he seems to kind of change his colors too, like a chameleon with the actor, with the director rather that he's working with, which is kind of an interesting thing to study. But I like him in this. I think he's also got a weird sort of underpinning of comedic chops that come out sometimes, like when he's getting harangued by the guy and he's like, you're in the middle of the road, jackass. And he's like, can you tell me where something is? And he's yeah. like, you're Turkey or something. Like <laughs> it's a, he, he could be funny. Yeah, definitely. You know, it's, it's too bad. We don't see more of that of him in this. Yeah. He's uh there's a, he's a decent actor in this as far as just getting the, the frights, getting like capturing the moment and the electricity of different moments. I, I enjoyed the, uh, when he's in the truck and the maps are going everywhere and the air is, like the anti-gravity i guess is like fucking all the things up in his truck or whatever and then he's he's got he's like the entire time he's holding his flashlight like this like up towards himself like a lightsaber hilt or whatever and he's scared and he's just looking around or whatever and then i love the shot where it's outside the truck and the flash and the ship leaves but nothing's happening and then the flashlight just comes back on and scares him like that's a really brilliant, <laughs> so, that's a really brilliant it's shot. good shit yeah. i mean can so, you yeah. think i think spielberg said he wanted steve mcqueen for this role who is huge in the 60s into the 70s right Think of things like Bullet, like Steve McQueen was, you know, a, a straight up movie star at that point. And also very handsome, very charismatic, sort of an early action hero for American films. I can't even see Steve McQueen, even an aging Steve McQueen in this role. It's a whole different flavor with, the, with being handsome and everything. And Steve McQueen almost took it. And the only reason I think Spielberg says he rejected it was because of the dinner scene 
the mashed potato scene where he had to start crying. And he said, I can't cry on film. It's like my weakness is my Achilles heel. I just can't cry on cue. So I can't, you know, I can't do this. And Spielberg's, Spielberg wanted him. You know, he's a bankable movie star, right? So of course he wants him. So he's like, I'll write that scene out. And McQueen was like, you'll be debunking your entire film if you take that scene out. That's the emotion. That's the meat of this character, what he's going through, the emotional turmoil that he can't describe. Mm. So it is ironic that Spielberg almost all but got rid of that in this film anyway, right? It's, it's basically the son that cries in that scene, right? Where the, you could see- That's an awesome, the that's actually an awesome, beast. that really is an awesome scene. Yeah, I wonder oh, if that so was, good. yeah, that's right. It is the son, that is a wonderful scene. I totally, so I didn't write that down on my notes for some reason. That is a great scene where he's just horrified, you know? Um, yeah. Like what's happening to dad and dad can't explain it. Like, why not play that up? Why not see the kids reacting to that? The wife reacting to that, you know, like Terry Gar is a good actress. Mm -hmm. Like why not give her something else to work with besides being this cartoonish housewife? I mean, we all know her from things like Mr. Mom and stuff, but she could do more, you know, she's a good actor. So, you know, it is ironic that even without Steve McQueen, that all that emotional stuff was kind of just, gathered up with the arm and just swept out of the movie because i think that would have been really cool to see like again this guy's emotionally falling apart it's affecting his family but he can't even describe why that's kind of neat you yeah know, it the is effect I, of this thing that is one of the cool elements of the film is just the psychic effect that the aliens have on them and i love the way it plays out with like getting the people getting sunburned and stuff and now he has half his face is burned and, and, it, and the woman's whole face is burned like that's really good shit that's really really smart and interesting and so they they do there is some there are some interesting elements of of um i don't know of panache with Definitely. It, but, but what do you think about the psychic connection that the aliens make to them? That's always so creepy to me because I, I think we have this assumption that there are like there are five senses as we understand them or whatever, that there's more than that. And I wonder if the aliens are in touch or in tune with that kind of stuff. And if they would, and obviously we know through all the C weird CIA programs and everything that they were fucking all about. Doesn't it make you, <laughs> this is what I wrote in my notes and I didn't want to get into this until the end, but I guess I'll just say it now is that, doesn't all of this stuff just make it everything that's happening now just make it seem like, oh, that makes sense. That makes sense. That If only you change the presupposition that it's actually real, that aliens existed. So it's like, why were why were he the, why was the CIA so obsessed with remote viewing for like 25 years, you know, and all of that kind of stuff? Is it because they saw other species doing it? Like, that's I don't know. So I, I just I, I love the idea of the psychic connection. I'm wondering what you think of that part of the movie. And you know, P.S. I learned NASA channel back to mid to late eight eras, seventies NASA and the United States Air Force both refused to cooperate in making this film with Columbia. I think it was Columbia, right? But I mean, what does that say? Yeah, they have that weird triangle logo instead of like some sort of organization. Yeah, is, yeah, which is which yeah, is dude. It's like yeah. you know that's telling too. The psychic connection is interesting because is it intentional and manipulative manipulative on the part of the aliens or is it kind of inadvertent? You know, is it just this strange effect that they happen to have on humanity, not just on anything mechanical or electrical or metallic or magnetic, but on humans themselves? Why are these people, you know, building mountains out of shaving cream and mashed potatoes and drawing relentlessly, you know, this mountain, this landscape and stuff like that? Is it some sort of psychic effect, like a power that they have that obviously humans seemingly don't have, or is it something that's just some sort of fallout in this interaction? Because it is, if you think about it, being manipulative, even if it's not necessarily harmful, it still is kind of a little insidious mm -hmm. on the part of the aliens, even if it the, the purpose is to draw the humans to that meeting point right to that devil's tower that unmistakable it's got to be this thing this unique one of a kind landmark we're going to drive you there you know um it is interesting cuz it's not completely friendly then or it's not completely you know there's some sort of manipulation going on there where you know it's the puppets and the puppeteers they're obviously more powerful i like the little hints along the way too as far as their physical form like going through the dog door and stuff like that. Obviously they have to be relatively small 
P.S. Where is their dog? <laughs> they don't have a dog. <laughs> no one thought of that. I don't know what's going on with the. Uh, I don't know what's going on with the the, the whole. I, the whole family dynamic in the movie is so strange because it's an afterthought. Yeah, like they, he abandons his kids. Totally. I mean, his wife obviously leaves, but he has no concern about that. Now I know he's overwhelmed and supposed to be like mentally insane and and obsessed with this. By the way, what if the aliens got in touch with a psychic vision for someone who didn't have artistic merit? Like mm. clearly, this woman could draw. This we have. A, I guess Richard Drive is like Michelangelo. He's creating a fucking huge why does he have to do it in his house i mean that's a cool scene <laughs> i'm sure that that was like an idea that spielberg had and was like yeah we got to get this we got to get this in there but i'm like why wouldn't you just make it outside i don't know what what you're crazy like you don't care what anyone thinks so why do you have to throw everything inside is it because it's a cool shot and uh, i just love yeah it's just it's a good idea the neighbors He's smoking be shoveling cigarettes dirt, that. it's it's so shoveling dirt through his kitchen window it, throwing bricks in his son's helping him He's taking shrubs out of the ground it's just spielberg like it's just a visual. It's a great idea. And we're going to build the movie around it. And I love I love it. I got to say, it's ridiculous. It's nonsensical. But that's why I love this man's movies. You know, he just builds idea. He builds movies around ideas that are visually compelling. <laughs> you know, what I mean? and what better way to show a person's losing his mind by in front of the entire neighborhood PS, not just his family. He's uprooting all his plants and shoveling wheelbarrows full of dirt into the window, taking skids of bricks and throwing them. You're at, you know, and you spend 20 minutes being like, what is the purpose of this? Obviously, there's a payoff when he's building this gigantic, <laughs> you know, like sod sculpture in the middle of his living room or whatever. But I mean, that's the type of thing that you get from a Spielberg, you know, especially with no one reining him in. It's just he's just he's just flying off at the brain. Yeah, it's it's it. it's cool. It's just it is interesting because it's it was very silly, but it did. I was just wondering the entire time because of the woman's like beautiful drawings and everything. I'm like, what would that what I, what would have I done? I'd be like, I'm I'm having I'm having a lot of trouble. I'm seeing a, it's a, a pillar point. of rock. I can't describe it. I'll it's never be able to draw point. it. It's like a cylinder. I don't know. Um, yeah, why are they yeah. invoking artists like creatives on purpose? That's another great point. Yeah, who knows? Who knows? So what do you think about the, this looked like it was going to be a MacGuffin, which was like the whole airplanes in the desert, like mm. all these different things. I didn't know exactly how they were going to get to this. And then when I saw the alien craft open up at the end and a person start walking out of it, I'm like, oh, it's going to be the pilots. Oh, so th this is a cool idea. But what do you think about this? Uh, this, this movie does a cool job. Very, so in, if Independence Day makes a connection to Roswell by being like the Roswell ships were actually scout craft. The aliens that are inside of those craft are the same aliens that are coming to invade. The ships turn on when the mothership approaches, all that kind of stuff, right? So they make some sort of real life connection in Independence Day. Here, I think they make some sort of real life connection with the abductions, like the idea, especially in the 60s and 70s and Fire in the Sky is one of these stories that we always refer to constantly of, um, of people being abducted and they deal with that. And I think that that's a, a cool thing. Again, if you're trying to stay narrow and the movie should have been much more narrow, it would have been cool if that was the background radiation of the movie was like, well, well, we're connect. We, we are um, psychically connected to go to this place. The government's going to this place at the same time. And the background of that people have been abducted for all these years and they're going to be released from the ship at the end. I think that all oh, that's pretty cool. So I'm wondering what you think about dealing with that. And doesn't it also put it into a new light knowing what we might be knowing recently and now that, Maybe people have been abducted. I mean, that's what I was saying. That was what I was saying to you. I, I, I said in our siblings text message thread, I think a few weeks ago, I'm like, were those motherfuckers telling the truth? Because that's the craziest part of all. Like, we just assume they're lying. And it's just a scary story. But maybe they weren't. And so I like that this deals with that. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I love the set piece. Again, the Spielberg, you got the set piece. You got the World War II planes. I thought they were P-51 Mustangs. And I had to look it up because I was like, those that landing gear folds into the bottom of the wing. What the hell is that? I think they're Avenger bombers, US Avenger bombers. But I love the the you know the whole gimmick of these planes deposited in the desert, brand new, full tanks of gas, no trace of a human being, right? What the hell is this? That the aliens we find out are, are not only taking people, but they're taking stuff, right? There was a scene cut out of the movie. I don't know if it was the version you saw where there was a battleship deposited, I don't know if it was in the Gobi or somewhere else in the middle of the desert. So this image 
of this giant aquatic vessel just in the middle of the desert sand that they took at this battleship. They that. cut it. They cut it out. Oh, it they shouldn't. Shot. They shouldn't have cut it out. That that no, that's, it's that's so good cool. Stuff. It reminds me a little bit of another creepy story we love: the Philadelphia Experiment. Yes, that is what that I think what that reminded me of. Yep. You know, but I like that. I like the idea of that. I thought it was a little funny at the end. Where, you know, the mothership door opens and here comes all the humans that were abducted, the little kid. And then you see some sort of Swedish girl and you see the World War II pilots. They haven't aged. I'm thinking, why not just go for broke here? Let's get everybody off this. Let's get Vikings. Yeah, to- conquistadors, totally. Revolutionary dude. War soldiers, people from biblical times. Because I would love that. Not only it would say that the, the aliens have been doing this for hundreds of years, maybe thousands, right? That's kind of cool. But also... The comedy in depositing these people in 1977 Wyoming. There's your sequel. How are these? T- <laughs> it's like Encino <laughs> Man. How are these people adjusting to life? Dude, it's totally Encino Man. Before Encino Man, that would have been Encino. so. That would have been so awesome. Linkage. Here come these World War II soldiers. How are they going to assimilate? They just missed 35, 40 years or something, right? Yeah, they're, they're I, I the same that. age as when they left. It might be a little weird. But I love that idea from a serious point of view of just saying, like, here's a fucking caveman. Here's all sorts of different animals. Like A caveman. Perfect. Right. Like, like we I would love that. I think that'd be cool because that's what we were saying on one of our previous episodes when we were talking about these similar topics was we just look at alien abduction and all of this through the, the lens of modernity. But the reality is, is that they would have been doing, you know, they would have been doing this long before we had technology. That's what's that's what's so interesting about space and time. And so it would be cool for, yeah, for them to, I love that, like Revolutionary War soldiers or, yeah, Vikings. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Now you're putting everybody together. How are they going to adjust to coexisting with each other? They, yeah, it does come off as like too much like a, like Three's Company weird fucking cod couple shit, you know? So. And Ceno Man did it right, though, because it was just the one thing. You know what I mean? It wasn't trying to be too many things. I but love I that love movie. The, co- the comedic idea. That movie just, is so fucking good. Like, oh, dude! That movie's hysterical. And totally, it really is. Yeah, Paulie Shore. I love. I I love Paulie Shore. I think he's so Long Island's own. I believe Paulie Shore. I don't. It, it, I don't it, know. He, I might be making that up. Let me see. That might actually be totally made. Mitzi, actually, no, no, no. He's he, the son thinking, of. He's from California, I think. You know why yeah, I know you're this right. call? Mitzi. If Mitzi I'm not Shore. mistaken, he's Mitzi Shore's right. son. That's what I'm saying. That's who yeah, owns you're the absolutely right. comedy store. Yeah, Los Angeles. Yeah, Los Angeles. That's what I was saying. Right when I said it, I'm like, no, that doesn't sound right because yeah, yeah, I think because I know he had a connection to the comedy store, right? So that's right. But you know what? Yeah. I always affiliated him with MTV mm. and that's very New York. Mm. He was in New York for that. That's right. Yeah. He like during the Kennedy era and all that. It's so sure. Ken, it's so interesting. Kennedy's on uh, Fox Kennedy. News now, you know, yes. which is so interesting. She's like a libertarian, but. Um, Who was the guy with the long hair? Martha Quinn was of that Kurt era Loder. Too. He was. Yes. Yeah. Kurt Loder. Um, Kurt Loder. Yeah. He's a serious XM DJ on like a rock station or blend or something. Dude, those guys probably have so much innate knowledge. Like we always, uh, oh Ram- Ramon and I yeah. always talk, you might not know this guy. It might be a little after your time, but Matt Pinfield, do you know that? Uh, I know Matt Pinfield. Yeah. So like Matt Pinfield is like a rap rock, new metal, turn of the century, alt rock, like encyclopedia. And he apparently still does a lot of work in that area too. And like, we always talk about like he, we would just love talking to him about all the weird, cause he saw the weird cool bands that we loved back in the day. I love, he, did I he host him. 120 minutes? Yeah, towards the like later, later. Um, okay, that because I knew him from. He was basically like there. MTV was so cool back in the day. I mean, it was it was starting to get shittier in the nineties for sure. But they had all their different guys. Like Carson Daly was more of like you know your pop and and everything and your TRL yeah. and everything. And Matt Pinfield was more like I'm 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 here with corn kind of. I'm here with lip <laughs> biscuit kind of kind of shit that I you know I fucking fifteen year old Colin was eating that up. Definitely better believe that. So, um. Yeah, so the abduction stuff is so interesting to me, and just puts in the. It, I'm, and this is what I wanted to kind of get into, and because uh, more thematically, I guess, is just, aren't you, or maybe you're not? Are you thinking about things like this differently in these last few months now that maybe something is happening? So assuming it's not like a psyop or some major thing, that it just seems likely now that we've been visited and that we are we have in possession things that we don't understand and it just calls into question whether movies like this are that, are that zany at all and i don't think that they were made in that context in fact i think that they were made 
in the exact opposite context that this is this is a fun kind of sci-fi thriller comedy whatever it is and there's no grounding to this and now in hindsight it has a total different veneer to it in my opinion just based on what we know now or yeah. what we feel like we're learning let's say and i'm just curious if where your mind's at with these kinds of themes the last few months i mean there's so much food for thought. We all, as humans on the earth right now, have to be thinking about this in some form. And I, you know, I cop to not following the UFO stuff on the daily, but I do find it fascinating. So because I don't, I don't follow it on a week to week basis, I tuned into um, Ezra Klein's uh, New York Times podcast, which I'm relatively new to, but he's, he does some really compelling shows. And he did a show that was a roundup of basically what's going on here. Mm. You know, what is happening? What, what, what's going on? Is there anything to this? And how much so, right? And, you know, it basically questioned why the seemingly sudden government transparency, why the fierce uptick in stories and accounts and videos, what's going on? You know, is it you know, this sort of immediate change, like a 180, the complete 180 of like a uh, transparency. Is it distraction? Is it the government sort of copying publicly to accountability? So when something happens, they're like, we were trying to tell you, right? Or is it actual? Is there shit going on? You know, or maybe it's a combination of two or more of those things. I'm not sure. But it's definitely, or you know what, Kyle, also how much does social media play into it just in the terms of getting instant news from many different sources immediately? I'm not just thinking of Instagram and Twitter and Facebook, but YouTube, right? And sharing images and videos from all over the place. It's super interesting. It definitely stops and gives pause and makes you think. And I'm not sure really what to think because I want to believe, like I kind of want something to happen. And I've said this before and it's, it's not, it's not mischievous Dagan popping off here, but I kind of want to see what humanity's reaction is to it. You know, I think that's been the thing for a long time. If there was all these black ops and psyops and cover-ups, all CIA-related things happening through the years where they were just hiding it from sight. I think it's hard to think that a lot of that is not just trusting a public sort of reaction, right? It's, it's basically fearing what humanity's reaction to that would be if we had actual discernible proof that there was extraterrestrial life and they were sort sort of around, even if they're not trying to make contact, just being seen by fighter pilots and such. I think it's really interesting. And I think, I want to believe, I'm not being cynical, but it's so funny and the movie does explore this a little bit. There's always that thorn in our side. There's always that one aspect of lunacy like this person's crazy this person this person is incredible they do that when the government's sitting at the table with all the ufo enthusiasts like all the fanatics right and it seems to be the government official is sort of claiming like look we don't know what's going on here what can you guys tell us and the one yahoo at the table goes on you know tells this story about encountering bigfoot and the Richard Dreyfus character is like, oh my God, like this is exactly what we don't need. This is why this stuff gets a bad look and people poo poo it as like a tabloid account because of there's always somebody there to make it look like, all right, this is just, this is just a crazy person, you know, which I love the, the movie goes into that a little bit and that that's kind of a timeless thing over decades. Still now, I think my natural inclination is to be like, is this person crazy? Like, that's my first thing. It's like, what is, the, what are this, is this person's credentials? Where are they coming from? Are they actual grounded, sane human beings? Or is there a propensity for insanity here? You know, that's where I go with it. But I'm really interested to see where it goes from here. I know I've said before on the various shows, every time this comes up in conversation, that 
it smacks of the government trying to distract us. Like, look over here. You know what I mean? Like all this crazy shit's going on over here. Look over here. But I don't know if that's just me, a person, a Gen X are going on 50 that's just watched too much TV, too much science fiction, conspiracy theory Right. I'm also, type. I'm all, the reason I'm not, con- I think this, you always have to look at everything as a psyop, right? I think that's totally true. We're propagandized so deeply that you'd be foolish not to look at anything and be like, why are you doing this? That's but, I, but I don't think, here's my argument against that, is okay. that I just don't think they're doing it hard enough. It's all, it's happening in the background. Like, what are you distract? What are you distracting us from? Who and what? Like, that you're not even. You seem like you're not even paying it. To, most people are still not even paying attention to it. Yeah, and no. the government seems to not really be talking about it or trying to talk about it as little as possible. So I'm like, that doesn't come off to me as a psyop. That that comes off to me as like something someone trying to keep the lid on something. My th- so I think there are a lot of interesting theories. And since you've been listening to stuff, you've probably heard some of these. And and we've talked like. Some of the craziest theories I love are that they're humans from the future. I love that. And that in some sense, like doesn't, well, it, that doesn't comport with how we understand my, uh, rel- general relativity. You shouldn't be able to go back. You know, um, you should only be able to go forward in time. And again, you do that by dilating time, by going fast. So going backwards, we don't understand how that would work. And it would create all sorts of paradoxes. But they might be working in a framework like when you look at these ships or these supposed ships and you listen to the the, air, the naval pilots and everything talk about them, they're not working. They have no heat signatures. They're not working with propulsion or ion engines or anything. They're just using some other probably form of gravitational technology that we don't understand. So the, the reality is, is that general relativity is probably just like Newtonian physics and all of that was a stepping stone to general relativity is probably a stepping stone to another understanding of even deeper understanding of what's going on. And that might have something to do with it. So maybe those are humans from the past that understand now how to manipulate those things, understand that that really can or doesn't call, cause paradoxes. Right. For instance, realities, I think the argument against it is that like realities move at the speed of light so that if you were to go back and then reinsert into a, I guess, a timeline of some sort, that that reality from the paradox would move at the speed of light and so never catch up with the timeline as it's understood. I guess. And that's like where all these weird, you know, this is too, this is too sophisticated for me. I'm not, I like reading about science. I read or read a lot of science, but if you ask me to go into the papers or whatever, I wouldn't know it like the first thing. So I'm really just talking about it from, from my own understanding. So that's like one theory. And I think that that's kind of interesting. And what I was saying was that if you could comport that with relativity, general relativity, which you can't, so maybe some understand that might be the most realistic answer, yeah. right? Because you're not at least suggesting that it's like another species. You're suggesting that like humans in the future are fucking dipping it in and out of time, yeah. which is in and of itself nuts. And maybe it was an accident. I mean, those that's like it's like back to the future kind of stuff where it could be that they're dicking around and they they crash. It's like, why would these craft crash and all these things? It's like maybe they just fucking didn't mean to be where they were in the they were in a different time in a different place. I mean, all that kind of stuff's possible. I love that. But but my real my real thought is, is that we. It's not that that like we that the earth that the universe is teeming and the galaxy, our galaxy is teeming with more life than we probably understand that, as I've said on previous shows, we are beaming and yelling out our existence to the universe now for the first time. Now, that existence travels to the speed of light itself, but. You imagine that the weakest TV signals from the 30s are probably, what, 80 light years away now? So, um, you know, 90 light years away. So that's a, a pretty good distance. So people might have picked them up. And it just seems that I would believe that we have found shit, that we have encountered things, and that we are reverse engineering things that we have. I don't know that I believe that we have alien bodies and I don't know that I believe that we are like that we have interfaced with them in any way. Mm -hmm, I think mm -hmm. we're encountering them and they're zipping away that they're doing all these kinds of different things, but that there's evidence perhaps. And this is what's so fascinating about it, that perhaps the evidence is ancient. And that's where we have to think about time as a really important concept in this, that just because we're limited in technological time doesn't mean that they were. You know, they could be a fucking ancient species that have been that has been spacefaring forever for all we know. So 
I think there's something to it. I just, I really do just because why, why would the people that are talking about this lie? That's a big, that's a big sticking point for me. Like career operatives, Navy and air force pilots, pilots that fly $50 million machines, you know, and more money machine, you know, like that are trusted with crazy, you know, every once in a while, a pilot goes rogue and like kills himself. Right. By like crashing a plane or something. But like, generally speaking, these people are very rigorously standardized to even get into these things because of the damage they can do to themselves and to someone else. I mean, a, a rogue fucking Air Force pilot can take a Hornet into downtown New York City and fucking launch all of its missiles, you know? Right. Like, these so, are vetted people. Right. So I just, it doesn't seem like, I just don't know that they would lie. And when they say things like we encountered them every day for two years. And that it seems like there's a lot of people that have been knowing this and that this stuff has kind of been bumbling around for decades. And it puts a lot of like Bob Lazar and all these other guys into a different context. I believe I love I it. really do. I believe I, 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 I don't know. I, I really I push the I, I put the limit for myself at saying, like, we understand what it is or we know who we're dealing with. But I think we've encountered things that we definitely know are not from here. And sure. I think that that's uh, fucked. You know, and I think that I, and I understand why that's something that they've wanted to hide for so long. The conspiratorial part of my mind, though, simply goes back to how has this not leaked? But then you go and you say, like, well, people have tried. You know, like people have been marginalized and made to look kooky from the fucking 40s. By, Absolutely. And there's a lot of them. So yes. Maybe they have tried and you just it's didn't want to hear it. It's absolutely. Fa- I mean. Yeah, I mean, there's so much to what you say. I mean, I love the human beings from the future theory too, and I've bandied about that on past conversations. But what I really love about that is that it makes sense in that one of the reasons we see them sometimes, right? Because they're flashing back to all different points of humanity. And I love the idea of going back to the 1600s, going back to biblical times, the dinosaurs see these things because they're going back to all different periods. I just love the sci-fi fun aspect of that. There's been UFO sightings since way before we could ever possibly now in 2023 have accounts. There's a whole vertical of pseudo, what people I think we call pseudo study, although I find it interesting of people trying to connect biblical events with what could have been alien encounters. Oh, see, that's interesting Which is good shit. You know, like wheels in the sky and the star Bethlehem and all these different things. Yeah. So, But the problem is that takes out of account the very extreme for me likelihood that there's got to be life out there, right? That doesn't account for that. So that's what I don't like about the future humans theory, the time travel theory is that there's got to be, there's just got to be something. And I'll tell you, man, when we do get proof positive, and we've said this before, when we do have absolute 100% evidence of this, it's going to be a shift in humanity like we've never experienced probably certainly in our lifetimes but in many hundreds of years like having that knowledge is going to change everything you know what i mean think about that past any kind of any evolution any sort of progress that we've made over the years industrially or technologically or medically or scientifically like can you think of a bigger thing i mean just the excitement the anxiety that it's going to induce right until we until we get answers which could take hundreds of years like this these type of things could play out over more time than we could even really conceive of as one generation or one sort of wave of humanity or you know what i mean like it's so beyond our grasp here's the one problem though Carl. With the most recent, especially the most recent supposed UFO sightings and these screen grabs and pics and videos and everything like that. To me, this stuff that we're seeing, whether we get a glimpse inside the cockpit at the little alien pilot or the UFO flying saucer itself, really looks like 1950s fantasy sci-fi. Like what we've always depicted in like illustrations and B movies and Roger Corman shit. You know what I mean? Like, no, I don't hear anyone saying that. And that's a problem. Like really these people, the Roger Cormans of the world were such, they were such so prophetic 
right? That they, they knew exactly what these things were going to look like. I think it's more than that, isn't it? Because it, it goes back to like the gray alien. The, and I mean the gray type alien for people that don't know, like, you know, you just go look it up. It's like the famous way we see aliens is like that. That all might come from people who really saw that shit. You, know? you might be right it, because that's it, true. And then it, it, and then I'm not saying the artists themselves were the people I'm saying. And then that seeps into the consciousness so that it confirms like our earliest assumptions about them, because I'm always fascinated by that Roswell crash, specifically in 47, specifically because of the newspaper shit that happened the day of and after and then how the Air Force finally got there and then everything got squashed. Right. So. They were looking at they were talking about saucers and these fucking aliens with huge eyes and all these crazy things. And I don't know, man, like maybe that's actually the thing. That's that's what I'm so fascinated by. Like in some sense, if you are uh, this gets in a little bit of pseudo archaeology and I know people aren't crazy about Graham Hancock and all that. Some people aren't or whatever. But I do think there is something to the idea at the very least that we don't have a proper accounting of our past at all and that. I think what the like Hancockian style archaeology suggests is that early civilized humans actually inherited a lot of the things that we look at as things they built. And I think that the Sphinx is one of those major things. Like the Sphinx is so like the Sphinx when the science is done is become older and older and older and older. Like it is so old. And I think one of the major things is the way it's weathered indicates that it, there was, it, it was so, it's so old that the, the weather systems were different and all of that. And, like it, it's it's it was rained upon in a major way. And I just think that like all this might interconnect, like when you think about being visited and like ancient technologies and all that kind of stuff, I think that that still is very much in the, the realm of pseudo history. But you can imagine a, priv- a primitive people not being able to communicate forward through time what they actually saw or experienced. And so I guess what I'm saying is that maybe we're not really the first people to ever experience this. We don't have a full accounting of it. I no. When I'm realizing more and more about science, there are obviously true things that are true, but everything's through a political or an ideological prism such that when you think about COVID, right? Like it was verboten to say that COVID came from a lab in, in oh, China, right. right? But it did. It fucking did come from a lab. That's basically being readily acknowledged now. And you just look at that and you're like, why? you all knew that. So the only answer could have been ideological or political why you're keeping these things away. And so I always just look at these different choices being made in, in reality, like uh, the way the government interfaces with us, big business, whatever, that they're just kind of usually lying and maybe even for no reason. Because I think one of the, one of the things that, um, that David Grush guy, I think said the, the, the whistleblower was that there hasn't been a lot of success reverse engineering anything like we don't even under we have no framework to even understand how this shit works that like it it gets bandied between the defense contractors and they're really vacuum tight so like you can't i think the one of the i don't know if you think this is interesting one of the theories about why this might be going public is because the government finally acknowledges that they need help oh like you know that you can't you would want a specialized series of interconnected generations of people working on this that all share notes and and knowledge. But when you're siloing everything off, they say that they could have, you need to go to Silicon Valley. Like you need to go to all, you need to like allow normal academics and people that come up with the big ideas to really get into the nitty gritty, not just yeah. your, you know, not just Raytheon and all these different companies that have been Dude, that's a great. And that is one of the theories too. That's a great point. Or else you're really setting yourself back by not providing that network over expertise, but also over time. Right, exactly. Right? To just, in other words, to say like enough with the fun, like the hyper level of secrecy. It's like, what could you accomplish if we just all acknowledge that this was real? I love that. Yeah. I mean, that is something I never thought about, to be honest with you. And I, I do wonder, you know, it's always interesting. And again, maybe this plays into sci-fi and sort of, you know, too much of a fictional account. But I do wonder also, like, is it the government just fearing a panic or fearing that, you know, their people, citizens, humanity, whatever, will react with a call for accountability or setting up space weapons or whatever? You know, is it going to be a, a psychological mess? And maybe even beyond that, maybe physical, you know, some sort of you know, a reaction that would be, you know, to the detriment of, of people. I'm not, you know, I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I mean, there's a lot 
there's a lot going on too. I mean, with that Ezra Klein podcast, he had one specialist on who was saying she was saying she um she was talking about the Navy pilots recently over the last few years. I think now retired. One of them's famous. I can't remember their name, but because he's been on the record with this stuff. Right, right. I'll find his name. Yeah, off the east coast of the United States, naval pilots. I guess F eighteen pilots, maybe F twenty two pilots. Ryan Graves sure. is the guy you're talking about. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And what they've encountered. And it sounded so believable. Like they would see things that I would think, and I don't mean to turn this into an anime thing, but I I constantly think like we're judging from such a slim area as humans, right? We're judging from such a slim area, such a slim perspective of knowledge and stuff and sort of taking our own account of what we think organic beings are, humans and animals, right? And why can't it be more like Evangelion, right? Where these aliens are attacking Earth called angels, right? No one knows when they're going to show up, but they keep attacking. They want to dominate the Earth. They want the Earth's resources, whatever. The Whatever is left of the Earth forms this organization called NERV. They assemble these robots to counter these things whenever they show up, right? But when these things show up, they're, they always have different powers and different forms. Like sometimes they could be like a giant geometric cube with with some sort of force field sometimes it's a giant pendulum thing like they're they're horrifying these these aliens are horrifying because they take the shape of things that don't look like anything we would perceive dating back since the earliest fiction related to outer space right they're just these fucking crazy things that have crazy powers and they're always changing so we never know what to expect on Earth, and we never know where they're. I love that. Show I up. never knew what that show was about. To be honest, it's good. It's good shit. Yeah, it's really, really visionary. You know, really visionary science fiction. Kind of yeah. scary. Yeah, you know, it sounds. Scary. And it I love scary that in too. the same way that um, what's that other show? Uh, Attack on Titan was scary. Yeah, I only yeah. saw the first season, but that was really scary. Yeah, because it's mysterious. Right. Exactly. Anyway, you know ahead. why there's bad guys? They're taking out people, but we don't really know why. And in Evangelion, it's horrifying because. You would never expect it to be the way it is and the way it's behaving. And now this giant geometric cube is opening up and forming all these geometric shapes and screaming like a hu- like it's really weird, but it's it's haunting. It's kind of chilling. But anyway, this fighter pilot said he and his partner, he and his wingman at one point saw things that they thought were drones from afar. But as they got closer, they realized sometimes these things were lingering in the sky for over a day, like over 24 hours, which no drone really has. So fucking to, creepy, dude. Without moving. And they were just cubes inside of spheres. Like they were just, maybe it was kind of jellyfish-like, but completely geometric. You know, like maybe gave off the sheen of something That's organic. Gone. Isn't that so it? unsettling? It's weird. Yeah. That, that right? was standing so still, I think is what is weird. Yeah. Yeah, not moving. Just dead still. Just yeah. dead still. Not moving a centimeter. Holy moly. You know? So that's the kind of stuff I like too, because that makes it more believable for me. Like things that we really can't wrap our heads around. They have to have good footage of this. Show us. I know. know? Show it. If it was there for a day, you didn't send sorties out there like fly around this thing. I'm sure you did. so weird. Oh my God, dude. I'm going to shit myself when we finally see this stuff. (laughs) But why? Why is there always that one missing tether? You know, why always that one thing that could just, if you just put that piece in, it'll complete the puzzle, but it's never complete. Yeah. I think a lot of it just, God, man. I mean, it's so deeply psychological in some sense. You're dealing with military men, honor bound, debriefed immediately. I mean, can you imagine when you land on your aircraft carrier or whatever, or back at at the base, when you see one of those things, they're probably all over you, you know? Um, And you I'm sure have a bunch of people in your face before you even have a moment to think about anything. And then by the time you have a time to assess what you just saw, you're like, well, it's, there's no option for me to tell anyone about that, you know? Um, and I, so people like Ryan Graves, um, David Grush, you know, who was a, an, a, like an intelligence officer, very well respected. Like no one's been able to dig dirt up on these guys. Like no one's been able to be like, these guys are not reliable for this reason. This guy's being paid by this thing that the, they're not lying. So I don't know, man. Like I just, it's so interesting to think about. And again, I know this is a, 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 this is ostensibly about close encounters of the third kind, but this is how we got off on this tangent to begin with is it's interesting to think about a situation where we look at everything that we've been told 
and all the marginalization and all the, you know, fucking, co- yeah, go listen to Coast to Coast or whatever. And, you know, Philadelphia Experiment, all these stupid things and re- remote viewing and all of it, it all just has a different flavor. If you know that this stuff is real, then it, then everything I assume, and I think that might be one of the things the government's afraid of, although I don't know how much risk there is in disorder over this, but it's just the government lied about if this is true, the government lied and obfuscated and hid this from us for a long time and they had no right to do that. Like, and that's a big problem about who has the right to know what and order and disorder and all of that, because I don't think that need that should be hidden from no. people like, no, no, that's a, and I, I don't think it, and it really does show like, uh, an, an international organization of us that needs to deal with this because it's it's about more than it has nothing to do with the United States. I right. really highly doubt it. Now, it could be that, as I've said before, and I think that the common theme is, is that the nuclear bombs drew them or drew their attention potentially to us. Right. Because of it, it was clear evidence that we had learned how to split the atom, which is a serious step in. First of all, it's a step that means that we can now destroy ourselves and destroy our planet. But it's also a serious step in probably understanding the frameworks of science that they understand, and they know that. So there, there could be something to that, and that is very American because we didn't make the bomb. But it, I don't know, man. If if they have like evidence and they're like, listen, we're being visited by fucking extraterrestrials, I think that everyone needs to know that. Like, I just, I just think that that's you have the right to know that, you know, as a human being. Yeah, yeah. You know? I mean, you you paint so many good points, man. I mean, and you know, is the government looking at it like we want to cop to this if we could, but it's a bridge too far now because now in admitting all of this, they're going to know that we're to be, we've been lying for so many decades, you know. And also, you bring up a good point too about like government officials and fighter pilots and stuff, you know, consummate professionals, some of our most important people protecting the country and in really really serious roles and it's almost like a much bigger scenario a much bigger example of like think of a police officer not making a traffic stop because they don't want to do the paperwork right it's like they they probably have seen things for decades but they don't want to land and then deal with all the red tape and the questioning and the internal affairs or whatever the military version of that is because it's just too much of a hassle and they don't want to be conceived of as a yahoo right exactly because they're probably heavily in propagandized internally too. And I think some of them probably have and, and assume, and maybe some of that, some of it is over time secret weapons, but because people are always like, well, the stealth bomber was a secret for a long time and people saw it. I, I don't know if you know anything about this. Like people saw the stealth bomber and, yeah. and, and the government was like, you didn't see shit, <laughs> you know, like they really, they really did. And then, and then lo and behold, like, you know, decades later, the stealth bomber, everyone knows the stealth bombers. And so, but, that's what we saw. Yeah, exactly. It's like, yeah, you okay, you did see it. You definitely did. <laughs> um, but what's what's funny about it is that that's a pretty quaint piece of technology. What yes. these guys are encountering is not the fucking stealth bomber. And I just think that they would know the difference. We we're not going to make the jump from supersonic fighter jets to anti-gravity machine. There's got to be interstitial machines and understanding in between those two things. So and these guys are aeronautical geniuses. They're they're in they're in charge of these fucking weapons yeah. that move a thousand miles an hour and can fucking destroy shit in two seconds and have all this ordnance on it and everything. I'm like, I don't know, man. It's not like even no offense to like you know an infantryman or something, but you can imagine that like it would be easier for a crazy infantryman to get through than a crazy hornet or raptor pilot or one of these guys that I I just don't believe it. So. I'm going with a little Occam's razor and just the sense that, you know, my old fashioned Occam's razor, which is in the sense like the the simplest explanation is the right one. We are encountering things we of an alien origin. And um, that's reasonable. Yeah, that's reasonable, man. You know what I also love? Mm. I don't mean to be too, you know, um, not you can't be too peace, Nikki, but I don't mean to be over optimistic, but I like the idea of joining globally on something like this, because I really think it could usher in some much needed peace on this planet. It's not converging against a common enemy. It's converging to figure, coming together to figure something out as a planet and just putting our differences aside. I think it could be really constructive for for Earth. I don't think anybody ever thinks of it like that, but this could be a great way to join together as nations, you know, and and solve something together. Try to figure something out together. You pool all our resources 
put aside our differences, stop the bullshit if that's possible, you know. But what about us? I'm talking in layman's terms. But what about a sci fi political thriller where one of the countries on the earth are trying to manipulate our relationship with the aliens to use them against everyone else? Like, imagine a story where that's brilliant. Imagine a story where China successfully convinces the aliens of the virtues of communism because it's most like what they experience, you know, and so they use that leverage to kind of commun, you know, communize the the earth or whatever. Kind of a cool, very cool, cool novel idea, or whatever. You guys, can dude, know. that's an amazing idea. Yeah. I don't know if you should be talking about this stuff on the uh, on the show. You should be writing this stuff down with a little TM. Yeah, little I have I have all sorts of ideas. I don't know that the the, the uh, good shit because there is that that show Colony, which was really good actually, and they canceled mm-hmm. it after three seasons. That was about um aliens that came to earth but then humans collaborated with the aliens so there were like collaborationist humans and then like rebel humans love that and that was really cool but um yeah i loved it It was super super neat i thought it was fucked up in some way um so many cool there's so much cool shit you could do with it but it's also a little scary because any of this stuff could actually there's a slim chance of any of this stuff actually playing out we'll see i I will say this, and I could be dead wrong, and we could, dude. Literally, I'm saying this, and they open up their fucking, their like the White House being blown up with the laser and Independence Day. They just blow up my house, right? Right as I'm saying this, just be like this kid, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. But I don't think they're here to harm anyone. I, I don't see why you would be here to do that. Yeah, some people are like they look, they would look at us like a threat or something, and I'm like a threat of what? <laughs> And then they would say, like, I would believe that they might be here to monitor us and to to stop us from hurting ourselves, maybe in some sense. I just think that that's even a little too altruistic. I think that they're probably curious, you know, Um, and I think if they had hostile intent, we wouldn't even know because it would have been over already. You know, I love the idea of discovering a race of extraterrestrials or a planet or something that was, you know, like more primitive than us, like less evolved. But there's no way they could come here and discover us. Then we would have to discover them. If they had the power to get here, they have to be more evolved. But wouldn't that be funny? Like, would that be such yeah. a letdown of like these, like, I don't know, like jelly people <laughs> that aren't really capable of anything? <laughs> yeah, like what were the what are, what are the um the Hanar in uh Mass Effect? They're like the jellyfish people. <laughs> because that's right. Because, yeah, 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 yeah. You would imagine it. Mass Effect does a really nice job of exploring the different textures of potential with like what these different species would be like, like the uh, Krogan or like the Krogan split the atom and then immediately destroy themselves with it. (laughs) You know, like they fuck themselves up immediately. (laughs) That's Um, good shit. Yeah, like that is good shit. So um, who knows like what the potential is of, 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 but I I like the idea of us, of it being a mystery to us still. Like there's, it's, I like the idea of the aliens not hiding themselves and hiding them, not hiding them. But that's that's interesting too because if they were not hiding themselves, like wouldn't we see? Wouldn't normal people have seen them by now? Or are they just are they engaging with they what they understand as our military? Are they naturally working in the oceans, which I think a lot of people think they and I'm, I don't know if they talked about it on the Ezra Klein podcast, but I think a lot of the naval pilots think that they're hiding in the oceans because that's interesting because like they're coming in and out of them. Like where that's else? That's very believable yeah. to me. Um, so maybe that's why they're not being encountered by normal people, or and so they're able to hide. Generally speaking, but they don't. If things standing still for a day, they're not trying to hide, right? Like they're they they're they must be aware, dude. I don't know, man. If we could just figure out how to talk to the whales, they could be our, you know, that would be sick. Those could be our informants. I love that. It's like uh, <laughs> what's that? What's the planet in um. In episode one, Star Wars episode one, why can't I think? Oh, is that? Oh, Naboo, yeah, Naboo. Naboo, yeah, Naboo, where Naboo? they work with the, everyone on the surface and under the water. They all work together to fight off the trade fed, the the, the fearsome trade federation. I don't know. I love this idea of like an underwhelming alien race. Like we we build them up to be these all powerful things, and they're just like, seriously, this is what. It's kind of funny. It's kind of comical. We have so many good ideas in this pot. We got. Like fodder for like ten different movies or miniseries. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah, I, I I I wish I had more time to be creative. I I put all my creative energies and my sci-fi energies into the Herbroxia series right now, which is, which is mm-hmm, good. That's good though. Um, that's an outlet. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's just a little something. I have just a little a little vague world going on. We have the uh, Lily Mo expanded universe going on because, of nice. course, Super Perils of Baking. I don't know if I talked about this publicly, but Super Perils of Baking takes place in. 
the world of Hybroxia because at the end of Super Perils of Baking, if you get a 100% completion rating, there's a shot of Sabrina, the pilot in Hybroxia 2, as a little girl being read the book Super Perils of Baking by her That's father, cool. the pilot of Hybroxia 1. I yeah. like that. Yeah. And I like connecting those two Me things. Too. Who would have thought? Well, I did. No one noticed them. Um, <laughs> That's a no one at all? No, I don't. I have no idea. I'm sure someone noticed, but I, I don't, you know, who the hell knows what people notice or not. I, I see myself, like I'm playing that game. And by the way, Dick, you got to play the game Gravity Circuit. I know I told you about this game. It's oh, you did tell me about wild, it. wild, dude. It's so good. It's Yeah, I'm going to play that too. It's like Mega Man X meets Mega Man 4, 5, and 6 with its, and you'll see. Um, That's cool as shit. It's really, really good. Who's the developer for that? I think they're called, they're a new one. Let me see. It's something funny. Let me think. Gravity Circuit. Gravity Circuit Steam. It's, uh, well, I can't remember it here. It's you know, domest- Domesticated Ant is the name of this year. <laughs> and it's their first game. And uh, yeah, I think you'll really, really um, love that. I don't know why I brought that up, actually. Come to think of it running out of energy here well, what well else? i need to play i need to play something new so yeah i think you'll really enjoy that but i we got way off the topic here i don't know if it really matters though because well that's, it's it's attached well that's no i agree adjacent. and that's why i didn't want to see we were going to record like i said we were going to record this earlier and then i had to go to a um a doctor's appointment so we were going to and then dagan was running late so i called it because we were only going to be able to go about 90 minutes and i felt like we were going to have more to say, you know, yeah. because I, I love this topic. I know you do, too. You are the reason. And this really is a knockback, I guess, kind of style tangent is just like you're the reason I'm into this kind of stuff. I don't know why or how, but you introduce I think it might be Ray Bradbury or I don't know something like. It's we, not fire in the sky, is it? it, is that the, it fire in the sky might be one of those things, too, where we just inception. Point. Yeah, that might be it. And then fill, the Philadelphia experiment. Um, yeah, with you working like because I, I remember you, you, well the brand Philadelphia experiment from that was your friend Brian's yeah um, and then I learned through that what that was from you and all that we shared that with each other so it's like I'm I've always been interested in that and it, it could be amazing that we live in this time where we might have this final answer although it's also fascinating to, to think that there are people that definitively already know so they already have that answer and that there have been people over time that probably have had experiences and definitively know as well or knew as well. And I agree with you that it's going to be. I truly believe that, like, if that's confirmed in a demonstrable way that gets circulated and people understand what it is, I think it's like a, a completely. Earth shattering, potentially. Calamitous discovery about the place humanity has. um in the universe and yeah i'm ready for that because i i like the idea of us being small and inconsequential and nothing i think that that makes it more powerful like the experience more powerful in some way but um i know that that's going to shake people to their core and i think that that's one I of the interesting so one of the interesting facets of it yeah the whole dynamic's going to change with that knowledge i think we could survive it i just think it's going to change it's going to have to you're going to people are going to have to change their whole way of thinking like it's going to require a lot of us i think no matter what you know no matter what it is how it's revealed when where they are how often we see them just having that proof pod- positive knowledge of other life other intelligent life i think it's yeah that, i mean can you think of anything bigger than that anything bigger the discovering in this world God. currently in 2023 there's nothing bigger. god i think would be the only thing yeah sure yeah, like confirming one specific religion. This is going to, it'll change a lot. I believe in humanity, though. I think we could deal with it. We got this. Yeah, I think, it, I think it'll be, in some way, you understand why if the United States found this technologies or the allies, because, again, I don't know if you listen to this stuff, like the, the claims coming from these whistleblowers are that we first encountered stuff in the 30s in Italy. I don't know if you, you heard all that stuff. No. And, um, that like it was brought over here um, and you and that it's not necessarily a secret to other governments, but not every government would know and that they're all kind of trying to pretend that they don't know or have that, but they're all having kind of their own reverse engineering skunk works that are simply not netting any any fruit. And you just think about the the description of the ships, like you said, like a sphere with a square inside. It's like, OK, so geometric shapes like 
these are not it's not like even a design right it's literally just right. shapes like these would be naturalistic geometric shapes in math and right. so it's like maybe that would be the simplest explanation and maybe they just reduce everything to that essence you know um i don't know man i i'm i hope this is nothing if it's i will say this if this is a conspiracy at this point it's it's a uh it's pretty deep um and a lot of people are complicit in the hiding of it but i think a lot of people are probably scared i couldn't imagine what you sign and i think that um i think david thrush said grush said something along the line like when it was asked like has anyone died in interaction with the technologies or over and he said like yeah and it wasn't clear like are you talking about like people being disappeared or like having like you know being exposed to radiation or something um and so you can imagine that like things probably happen these, these, it, where it's, it's and people stay quiet and yeah, who's going to believe you anyway? Look what. And again, I say, I say, look what they did to Bob Lazar. Yep. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Who I think is going to be vindicated in some way because what he's that would be interesting because well, what he was explaining is basically what they're what they're going to is get are getting ready to admit. Yeah. Now, his whole thing, I think, is that he interacted with the ships. So I don't know if, um, you know, I don't know. It's going to be exciting. That Ooh. guy is super, super interesting. Now that you told me they showed up in Italy first, I totally believe in I would go to Italy first. Food, art, culture, beauty. These aliens have good taste. Yeah. Like I that, would definitely, if I was looking at the earth, I would go there first. It's, yeah, it could, it could have some sort of, um, <clears throat> I think they were indicating that, I mean, I guess we don't really know, but I, I was reading into it that they found like ruins of it you know like that it was it didn't just like crash in italy that it was it happened a long time ago in italy that's and, so interesting yeah there's a lot to digest here man yeah we're going on and on though is there anything else you wanted to say about the the film that we haven't touched on yeah i mean you know we should give a shout out to uh two players that show up in this in bit parts right carl weathers mm -hmm. apollo mm -hmm. plays a little military official and then lance henriksen did you meant did you notice him in the background he has a non-speaking no i don't think so we'll, we'll know him to be bishop later on in the alien yeah series. yeah i didn't but, uh, uh he's in there as a character named robert i want to say but no, it's interesting that he's in, has a named part because i think he's completely silent i think he's playing behind the bob balaban and uh francois truffaut characters yeah i was gonna say bob balaban was the one guy that i wanted to call out just because i like him but he as a Seinfeld fan, he plays like the fake NBC executive in like a series right. of Seinfeld episodes. And he's like so funny in that. He's so good. Because he's like so, so dry and like just totally flat in that in that role. And it's just so and they're so desperate to sell their script to him. And it's, yeah. it's so hysterical. He's the perfect straight man. Yeah. Yeah. He's great. I think the first time watching this, I watched it a couple of times for the show. I think the first, I was tortured. I was like, who the hell is that? Because he looks so different. And then I'm thinking, oh, yeah. Christopher Guest, Wes Anderson. He's in all the movies. He's in there two stables. He's in everything. Everyone looked older, dude. I, I was saying, Michael was saying like, he looks so old there. And I'm like, he was probably in his twenties. Yeah. And I'm, I'm like, well, I don't know what the fuck was going on back then, dude. Cause he looked like he was 50. No, Isn't no. And, so and I don't weird. mean it as an insult. Like he just, he looked almost like barely different from when he looked at it at Seinfeld, which would have been 16 years later, you know? So yeah, people just aged differently. They really did. We talk about that a lot in the seventies and eighties, like in movies, going back and looking at these things, they just aged differently. It's not like they were aging badly. I think it was also what was socially acceptable. Like it was okay to look like you were in your forties and your twenties. In fact, you wanted to, that's the weird thing. Now it's like, yeah, the exact you're going into your thirties, you're already thinking about Botox and shit. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Now so you want to, now you always want to look like you're 20 or whatever. Yeah. It's so strange. Dig, there's one last thing I wanted to um, to say to, to, for you to just look up uh, okay. in your tra in your travails around the internet mm -hmm. if you're interested is a thing called Oumuamua. Have you heard about this? No, I have so not. So it's O U M U A M U A. It's a Hawaiian word. Okay, Oumuamua, and it's this asteroid that is, I think, still as we speak, passing through the the solar system, but is a, is an interstellar object. So it's moving too fast to have come from within the Oort cloud or the Kuiper belt. So it's being, and it's also mega, we can't get a really good shot of it, but it's mega long and thin. Okay. So there, there are these theories that it's not an asteroid at all, but some sort of probe 
going through interspeller space at a mega fast clip because it just it wouldn't naturally form like that. Like it just would be weird to be this. And so you can go read about it. There's all these different theories about what it is, because some people think it's just like nitrogen ice. And then okay. some people think that it's it's like obviously then people look for what are called techno techno signatures, I guess, on it um, okay. and think it could be like a solar sail and all these different things. So it's it's mega creepy, but it, they discovered it because it's moving so fast. Like it's it's just moving so fast. It's not supposed it, asteroids and comets just don't move that fast. So it's not. Oh, yeah. It's, yeah. So it's not that it's necessarily being pushed by a solar sail or anything, but it could have been propulsed at, at some other point in interstellar space. And so people are, <laughs> you know what it looks like? It looks like the rebel medical frigate. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. It's just kind of like this long egg shaped. You're exactly right. But you could tell it's like a little more organic. This is interesting. I haven't heard of this. Yeah. So you can go read about that if you want, because there's all sorts of theories of like, you know, natural theories for it, obviously. And then, um, yeah. So, and you know, people think it's just a probe or like one of the self-replicating probes that we have. Fascinating the of, yeah. shit. Wow. Yeah. This is so interesting. Wow. See, see what uh, you go back and watch a 45 year old movie and look at the conversation that could spring forth. Yeah. Steven Spielberg was still, certainly his interest in contact is evident and not only with aliens, but with like just super, the supernatural as well. Not, and not only in yeah. poltergeist, but in India, I mean, Indiana Jones is all about the interaction with the supernatural in some sense. So, um, his his appreciation of that is in turn deeply appreciated because it does give us these great conversations later on, and it was it was certainly prescient. A lot of it, a lot of his prescient. I think these. I think the more we know, the more interesting these movies will come off to people in the past. If you look at them through the relativistic lens of having been made at a time when this was like considered a fucking joke. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Complete tabloid checkout line at the supermarket fodder. Now that's what it was reduced to back then. Right. The very the very reality that it is that the, the conversation has crossed into serious news and serious journalism, even if it's not real, is just in and of itself a seismic shift. That that's absolutely worth acknowledging. Yeah. Very well said. I mean, it's really it's really true wh- where we are right now with everything, and it's. it's Man, it's just, there's so much going on. Like, it's so hard to follow. I'm always looking for that one bit of news. I'm sure a lot of people are in this position where you're you're looking for that one article, that one sort of, that one grain of proof that you could, that'll push you over the edge as far as turning your cynicism to, you know, something that's more tangible. Show us the, show us the sphere inside the square. I know you have 4K footage from your fighter pilots and their helmets and all the rest. Let's go. I know. How do we convince them that we're not afraid? Like we're ready. Uh, we're just ready. Get, drop it on us. Yeah, already, I yeah. want to show me that shit now. I'm Come so, on. I'm so tired of waiting. <laughs> all right, Dave, let's get the hell out of here. Uh, shall we end with a dad joke? Yes, of course. I got Allie, Sister Allie's cards here, dad joke cards. Oh, I only took some of them out of the box, but that's okay. It's just... Now let's Seaster Alley. Oh, you'll appreciate this. Uh, I went out with Dana for dinner. Oh, yeah. Oh, very nice. I went out with with to uh, with uh, Dana to dinner, and I thought we were supposed to go out Thursday night, but we were. Okay. We, we, she said Tuesday night, and she was right. But I wasn't ready. So when she came over, she waited outside for like fifteen minutes, and then she came and rapped on the door. And I just thought it was like a neighborhood kid. So Micah went and got, it and I kind of contained the dogs, and I'm just like in my boxers and the t-shirt, like working out. And, and then she's like, "Are you coming?" And I'm like, what do you, what do you, I'm like, I thought we were supposed to eat on Thursday. So I had this crazy event where like within five minutes I was like in the shower and then I was like running to her car and then, and then we ended up, but she's the, she's the more mystery sister. She, she doesn't appear on much on this, uh, in the she show. She refuses. Yeah. She doesn't want to do it. Also so much fun. I won't speak for Kyle, but so much funnier than me. You guys would love her. Yeah. Dana is really funny. Like she, I don't know. I think her hesitance mostly comes from the fact that she is a teacher. And she just doesn't want her kids, I think, to see, yeah, to see it. But the thing is, so is Allie, and she just doesn't care. No, you know? so two different, yeah, personalities there, for sure. Yeah, but I understand that. Yeah, it, I get it, it is it. kind I get of it. a conflict of interest. But, but it, it is. I t- keep telling her, I'm like, the unfortunate thing is, is, like, she's like, just do it without me. You know, like when I'm like, I want to do it with the. I'm like, that's kind of defeats the purpose, dude. No, that would. I would love to have Allie on for X, Y, or Z, but like to do the Moriarty, like I want to do a growing up Moriarty's mini mini series, and we need all four of us, or it's not going to work. And especially Dana, she was like the mother figure, you know. Oh yeah. How is how is it that we would do it without her? So um, we can't. No, it would be impossible. That was my partner in crime until Allie was born. You know, 
we, we spent five years together. Only Dana and I have inside knowledge of the first five years of the Moriarty kids' existence. Yeah. I mean, that's that's what I'm saying. Like she, and she's always checking me on things. She's like, oh, you said this, this was wrong, and this date was wrong, and you guys were wrong about this. And because she listens to the show. So I was like, all right, fucking hot shot. Come on the show and start <laughs> spouting off facts then. Let's get it that's on the record. That's the other thing. It's like, you do it. Yeah, let's get it on the record for God's sake. All right. Dave, let's hear the dad joke. All right, Kyle. Where do you learn to make a banana split? <laughs> I don't know. Sunday school. Oh, I should have oh, known that. That's a good one. That's a good one. I love that. Banana split. These are so dad jokey. I love these things. I love that. Why are there so many? Oh, by the way, I got this email during when we were recording and I was laughing to myself because I just, I, I was like, because it's like an Amazon email. I'm like, why am I getting an email from Amazon? And it's because I bought, I bought Pikmin for for Micah, oh, which yeah, she yeah, already yeah. got or whatever, but it was an email saying like, you saved money. And then it was a 12 cents rebate. It's like, just don't even email me, man. So leave Nintendo. Me, leave me alone. Assholes. I'm surprised Nintendo would allow that. 12 cents. What is this? That just came out. That's not going on sale for a long time. Yeah. I, I don't know, man. It's uh, if ever. I just don't, don't insult me with the email about the 12 cents. I guess. <laughs> um, all right, my friend. Well, it was good to be here with you. Thank you yeah, for thank you for the topic. We're going to get back into Final Fantasy, I think, next. Are you going to be ready to go or yep. do we need another week? To... No, no, we'll be ready. Yeah, we got a couple of weeks. So yeah, we'll, that's I good. think we'll be fine. Yeah, um, we'll be good. All right, perfect. So we'll be back into the games shortly. Uh, thank you for listening to our conversation ostensibly about Close Encounters, but really um, kind of, but more about aliens and all the rest too, which was fun. Um, I hope you enjoyed this episode of Knockback. Merch, lastdamnmedia.store, including brand new merch. I think you guys will really like some new stickers, some new t-shirts over there, all made in the US. Um, except for I, I learned, what was it? Our sweatshirts are made in Honduras, which I have no I have no beef with Honduras, so that's fine. They need jobs now okay. too. Um, and uh, Patreon support, patreon.com slash media. We appreciate you. More than 13,000 of you supporting us over there. Couldn't do it without you. Early ad free access and so on and so forth. We'll see you next time for more. Until then, goodbye. Knockback, a retro and nostalgia podcast, is a product and trademark of Last Stand Media and Collins Last Stand LLC and is recorded from Central Virginia and the Philadelphia suburbs, USA. The show was conceived by and is produced by me, Colin Moriarty. My co-host is Dagan Moriarty. Knockback's executive producer is Dustin Furman and the show is edited by associate producer Ben Smith. All of Last Stand's theme music is by Ramon Narvaez. As you know, all of Last Stand Media's shows, including Knockback, are fan-funded on Patreon at patreon.com slash laststandmedia. The following names are at the producer support level or higher on Patreon, and we're grateful for your kindness and generosity. 